לעשות לכם מקום, כבוד הרב. ירון ראובן. ירון ראובן. Good evening everyone. Uh, I hope you'll turn off your cell phone. Uh, we have a privilege tonight to have Rabbi Yarov Ruvay. And uh, especially since it's before Shavuos now. And everybody says in the, every day, they say, Kihim chayeinu v'yerechameinu. This is our life. Torah is our life. So uh, obviously coming here to hear a shir, you're testifying that Torah is your life. So that when you're davening every day, Birchus Priyashma, you're saying the truth. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce, everybody knows him, <laughs> so <laughs> please uh, enjoy. First of all, thank you very much for uh, inviting us to Skudim Mitzvot, for, for the host to Skudim Mitzvot. Uh, it's a uh, big mesirut nefesh to uh, arrange a shiur. And uh, as we always say when we start shiurim, B'Shem Hashem Na'aseh V'Natzliach. A person is uh, connected to HaKadosh Baruch Hu only if he reminds himself on a constant basis that everything and anything that he does is only because of Hashem. People ask all the time the question, you know, the whole story, which will Bezat Hashem go over a little bit tonight. Uh, why change? Why move uh, from uh, Wall Street business, which is in essence what everybody tries to, aspires to become success in Wall Street, success in business, success in money. Why leave all of that and go work for free? And hopefully uh, enough people give to the car and you can pay rent. Why? Why do such a thing to yourself? Don't worry. You like torturing yourself? You're such a, a sadistic? Something wrong with you? The reality is, Rabotai, what you'll discover in the shiur today, you'll discover from the story, is that at some point a person has to test his own character. At some point a person has to find out who he really is. And one of the things that I discovered in my life is that what you want to do, what you don't want to do, doesn't really matter that much. The whole point of the world is what Hashem wants to happen. What does Hashem want to happen? And the choice that a person has in this world is whether they're going to decide the right choice or the wrong choice of whether they will become a vessel that a Kadosh Baruch Hu can use to show the good or the bad. Either way, you'll be used as a tool. Either way, you'll become a vessel. If a person wants to be a vessel of truth, he wants to tell people the truth, tell people to come back to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, Ashra ve'ashachiko. Why? HaKadosh Baruch Hu says, oh, you're a good partner. I'll keep you around for a while. I'll take care of all your problems. All malchut. Somebody takes all Torah. Somebody takes on the... Uh, the uh, burden of Torah, which is publicizing it, learning it, fulfilling it. Hashem says, I'll take all malchut, all of the things of this world, I'll take care of it. What, the IRS wants to go after you? I'll take care of them. What, the bills? I'll take care of them. The doctors? Them too. Anything and everything. It's easy to learn it, it's easy to say it, but it's very hard to do. We all have learned it in Pirkei Avot or in different Sifre Musar. The hard part is doing it. And the reason why is because the test is every day. So, when I first came to the United States, almost 30 years ago, we came from a very traditional family that uh, from originally originated from Tripoli. In that generation, everybody was righteous in comparison to our generation. Even the people that weren't very learned still knew that you had to keep Shabbat. My grandfather, Allah wa Shalom, Saba Gavriel, he um, one time had a test. What was the test? The, uh, they came to him and they told him from, uh, that they don't like the fact that people are not working seven days a week. From now on, there's a rule. Everybody has to work on Shabbat. He says, uh, your government is, uh, has nice rules, but it's not for us. We're Jews. We don't work on Shabbat. 
and said, listen, we know they all listen to you. And if they don't listen, we're going to go after you. Saba Gavriel, who didn't know how to read or write, said, you can go after me. No problem. Doesn't make a difference. He wasn't some big Talmud Chacham. You could say, you could see his book somewhere else. No, he just knew Jews are not allowed to work on Shabbat. Jews are not allowed to light fire on Shabbat. Simple. That's all he knew. And that's what he did. So when nobody wanted to work on Shabbat, because Gavriel said it, they put everybody in jail. Everybody went to jail. And then they put my grandfather in a private cell. And one of the chief commanders came inside and he said, I'm going to make an example of you. And until you tell everybody they're, they're going to work on, on, uh, on Shabbat, we're going to hit you until you die or you tell them to do it. He said, you can do what you want. We're not going to work. We're Jews, we don't work on Shabbat. Long story short, this uh, commander doesn't do his own uh, bloodshedding. He has people do it for him. So he leaves, he brings uh, another Amalek inside, goes into the cell. But the good news is that this other person knew who my grandfather was, and he knew that my grandfather was one of the heroes of the town. And he said to him, listen, I don't want to hit you. I don't want to hit you, but if I don't hit you, he's going to kill me. So my grandfather said, listen, if you put one hand on me, you're not coming out alive. So it's your choice. Baruch Hashem, he didn't touch him, but he had to pretend he did, so he started hitting the wall. And the commander was happy to hear somebody screaming, even though nothing really happened. And everybody left. He got a satisfaction that he made an example of something, but in reality, nothing changed. Everybody continued keeping Shabbat. This is the generation from almost 100 years ago. I was born in a generation of not such heroes. We don't have such heroes. My generation, we went down a little bit because our parents and our grandparents didn't keep to the strict letter of the law. We adapted technology, we adapted, you know, we, uh, we've adopted technology on all of the modern things of the world and little by little, a person that's not good to the Torah can become a goy. So when we came to the United States, even though we, were, uh, we went to a traditional Masoti school in Israel, you know, we still had boys and girls, but everybody wore a keeper, even the girls sometimes. Uh, the, uh, we went to a traditional school, we had tzitzit, but on, uh, on the weekends, most of the kids weren't really religious, so we go to the beach. Most of the kids weren't religious, so you didn't exactly keep Shabbat, unless your parents were watching. Sometimes the parents didn't keep Shabbat, so it was like 50-50. As soon as we came to the U.S., since we were already 50-50, we're all on the borderlines, when the yeshivas in, in America said that they charge $500 to $1,000 a month per kid, it was very easy for my parents to say no. Why? We didn't have the money. It wasn't a matter of, I don't want him to go to a Jewish school. It was a matter of, I can't afford it. So we can't afford a kid to go to a Jewish school. So what's the other option? You have to send a kid to school. Oh, there's this uh, other school called public school. Okay, public school sounds good. Well, and teach him English? Oh, it's a good subject. And teacher math, perfect subject. Science, even better. So me and my brothers went to public school. What we didn't know is that the public school is full of goyim. And uh, unfortunately, once you're surrounded by goyim for a long enough time, you become just like them. You start liking them, you start befriending them, and you start adopting their behaviors, their reality. And uh, little by little, the little cute kids that you had at home that said Shema Yisrael at night don't really want to see Shema Yisrael. The little kids that uh, were very, very uh, close to your heart and like to go to Beknesset uh, a few times a year don't really want to go to Beknesset anymore. Why? Because they see Christmas trees in Rome. They see Christmas trees in, a, uh, in, in school and they want a Christmas present. The shock of my life when I was 10 or 11 years old was when one of my classmates, one of the few people that was actually Jewish, and Hanukkah was around. And uh, I said to him, oh, so uh, you guys celebrate uh, Hanukkah? He's like, yeah, yeah, we have a Hanukkah bush. <laughs> I said, what's a Hanukkah bush? I didn't know, I never heard of such a thing, Hanukkah bush. We didn't have that. We didn't uh, develop with the reform in Israel yet. We didn't know what a Hanukkah bush was. So I said, what's a Hanukkah bush? And he started telling me it's a, it's a bush. I said, do you celebrate Christmas? The, 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 like the Nusrim, like the Christians. He goes, no, Mapitom, no, we're Jews. I said, so why do you have a bush? Why do you have a tree in your house? He goes, that's what we do in America. So I went to my house and asked my mom, huh? Ima, we're going to get a tree? She wanted to hit me? Ooh, what? She wanted to send me to a different town. She said, what tree? We're Jewish people. What's the matter with you? I said, no, I, my friend has a Hanukkah bush. He has a Han you don't know what you don't know. 
You don't know what you don't know. So, okay, so we're not going to get a Hanukkah bush. Can we at least get the presents? We didn't have presents in Israel. In Israel, well, you get a little bit of chocolate. You watch uh, the, the fire, you know, the little candles. Eat some sufganiyot. Okay, finished. That's it. You get a little chocolate. You get a little uh, donuts. Finished. In America, they have all these presents and this and that. Why? Where do the presents come from? From the green. That's where it came from. Well, the people buy, you know, this uh, mountains of presents for their kids. For what? Or eight presents. Why? Are you competing with them? They get one present, we get eight because we're better? You have to be a millionaire just to survive the holidays. What if you don't have the money? So you can't be religious either? So you see, Rabotai, it's sometimes even the religious among us adopt some of the laws of the Goim, the Chukot Goim, and we fall. We fall victim to consumerism, to materialism, to all of the different things that little by little chip away at our Judaism. So it's not that you necessarily fall one shot, Hashem Yachem. But if you take a little bit of this and take a little bit of that, and one day you start watching baseball, even though it doesn't really make any sense and it's boring at first, and then a little while later you start watching football because that's the natural growth. You eventually want to go from this small ball to a bigger ball and these small people to bigger people that are trying to kill each other. And then but before you know it, you're a Jewish kid that wants to play in the NFL even though you're five feet tall and you're slower than, than molasses. Still, you want to be an NFL player. Why? Because that's what you watch on TV all day. That's what you watch on TV. By the time you're 18 years old and maybe you have a, a little bit of uh, muscles, you figure, oh, maybe I'll be a runway model. Maybe I'm going to go to a studio and take some pictures. They take some pictures, I'll make a smile, they'll put me in a Calvin Klein magazine. Little by little you start adopting some of the stuff that's around you because you think this is what you're supposed to do. This is life. This is life. And this is what happened to us. Baruch Hashem, me, between me and my three brothers, we pretty much tried everything. Everything and anything. Already at 10 years old, we already had jobs. Already we were making money in, uh, as, uh, as high school students. Most kids were still asking their parents for allowance. We were trying to help our parents just survive. We all had jobs. We all had something. But we went to school too. I liked school. I liked learning how to think. I liked learning. Uh, I liked getting good grades. So I was one of, the, one of the four that actually did pretty good in school. And most people thought I was going to be a lawyer or a doctor. But when I discovered that you have to go to school for at least another 10 or 20 years uh, for, for, to be a lawyer or a doctor, I decided that I quit before I started. But still, I went to university. I went to Binghamton University and I had a very good GPA of 3.9 and they said to me that this is very good but it's only the first year and it doesn't really matter. So I said, what's the point then? I said, oh, well, if you want it to really matter, you have to go for another seven years, you know, three more years here and then grad school. It didn't make any sense to me that you have to go for another eight years to finally pick what you want to do. Why can't I just pick it on the first year? I didn't realize that capitalism rules the world at that point. I just thought that, oh, maybe, uh, you know, I could just pick. I want to be a psychiatrist. Can I just do that now? No, no, you have to take all types of prerequisite courses in order to eventually be allowed to take the psychiatry classes and the biology classes and all these other classes. Why? Because every year you go there and you waste your time and smoke marijuana and go to clubs and waste your parents' money and borrow some more money from the government. What happens? They get more money. And little by little, you adopt their laws you adopt their mentality, you start thinking, wow, this is a fantastic system. You send your kid to an eight-year program just to hopefully learn one year. And every parent in America, their dream is, my kid has to go to school. My kid has to go to, you know, some university and then some grad school because hopefully he becomes one of a million doctors. The reality is that doctor is not what it used to be anymore. You could be much more successful simply being an entrepreneur. But because... You don't know what you don't know. You fall into the system. But I had something going for me. What went for me is that we didn't have much money. So after a year of paying for school, I had to drop out because we didn't have money to pay for school any further. So I had to go back to the work world. Now, since I was already used to making money, I needed to get a good job. So somebody introduced me to the electronics business. I did that for a little while, made a few dollars. But I hated it because I knew it was unethical. You know, they were selling stuff that's not, that's brand new, but in reality was refurbished. Fooling people, all left and right. The guy comes in for a thousand dollar computer. By the time he leaves, he spent four thousand dollars for stuff that he doesn't need. And even though that makes you a very good salesman, it also makes you a ganav. Makes you a thief too. So I hated the business and I wanted to leave, but I wanted to make a lot of money. So another friend of mine introduced me to the brokerage business, being a stockbroker. 
So I started working for a firm in Staten Island, but I only lasted there for a couple of uh, months. Eventually, I went to a different firm in the city. But the rules were that you pretty much have to pay your dues, something that the current generation doesn't actually understand. You have to work for them, you have to make them a lot of money, and eventually they allow you to make a little bit more. That's it. That's the way it works. So you come into the office at 8 o'clock in the morning. You work till about 8 o'clock at night. Maybe you have about a half hour break in between. And you do it all over the next day. So I did that for a few years, working for other people, paid my dues, learned the trade, learned what to do, learned how to, you know, a little bit about the stock market. And I saw my boss getting really rich. He started buying all types of cars and jewelry and houses. And I'm still making my $1,000, $1,500 a month. It was barely enough to survive, so I had to get a second job. But the Jew in me that didn't keep Shabbat, the Jew in me that didn't keep many mitzvot, still always knew that I'm not allowed to work on Shabbat. So I never worked on Shabbat, Baruch Hashem. But still, on Sunday I worked, and sometimes at nights I work, and sometimes I would do anything I could do to possibly make a few dollars, make side gigs, all types of stuff. I had to survive. After three years of this, I realized that there's no way for me to continue growing with this uh, company. I had to leave. I left, went to a different company, paid my dues there for another few more months. And then eventually, September 11th happened. Now, after September 11th, most people would think this is the worst time in the world because the market already dropped 50% a couple of years before it. And then after September 11th, the market dropped another 26%. So it was hell on earth for anybody that was a stockbroker. I had good news. The good news for me was I had no clients. So nobody hated me. But everybody hated everybody else's broker. Everybody all, why? Because everybody else lost their money. I'm the only guy that didn't lose anybody money. I didn't have any clients. So while their broker was uh, hiding under his desk because he lost his clients so much money, I was as fired up as can possibly be. I said, well, I can take everybody's clients. Why? They hate them. I don't, even have to, I don't even have to say I'm better. I don't even have to do anything. All I can do is just recommend something that I think is a good idea. Believe in it, research it, find out if it's good, you know, and then recommend it, and hopefully build up enough client base, and hopefully it works out. And that's what I did. So while everybody else was hiding, hiding under their desk, hoping that one day the economy will recover and the dot-com bubble will unburst, I was trying to acquire clients. But during the first six months, I didn't make any money whatsoever. So I started having to get to a point of borrowing a dollar every day, from a kid named Dimitri that worked in the office so I could buy coffee and a donut because that's all I could afford to eat. And that's what I ate. And every day I would have to sneak on a bus because I didn't have money for a metro card. And a few times they'll throw me off the bus because, you know, they got onto my trick where I would put the petro card and I would be, act like I was surprised, like Hollywood. Oh, it didn't have any money? I'll get you another one. Just let me sit down so I don't fall. And I would go to the back and hope that the guy forgot about me and fall asleep. So by the time I got back home, you know, everything goes away. This worked out for a little while, and once in a few times, uh, Shem, uh, you know, gave me a nice special bonus by having the guy be one of those people that actually was a makpid. He made sure he got his dollar fifty. He made sure he got his $2. So after a couple of stops, I didn't have the money. He'd throw me off the bus. and have to wait another hour for the next bus. Baruch Hashem. Anyway, this continued for a while. But I believed in it. I believed that it's going to work. And while the rest of the world thought I was crazy... My family, my friends, I believe that this is going to work. And eventually it did. After about six months of this nightmare, I made my first thousand dollars that I could actually keep. For me, it was all the money in the world. Next month, I made five thousand. The next month, I made seven thousand. Next month, I made ten or eleven thousand. Next month, sixteen thousand. And by November of 2002, a little over a year after September 11th, I made $117,000 in one month. This broke the office record. Nobody made that kind of money in that office. And I got on the map. I got on the radar. What, one of the reasons why was because the idea that I had actually worked. The investment that we invested in, Baruch Hashem, actually worked. People actually started making money in a down market. So naturally, everybody thought I was a genius. And they started sending me all their friends and all their extra money and all their other accounts. Little by little, my business started growing. I started investing in some other things, and they also worked. By 2003, August of 2003, I became the number three top producing broker in the entire country for that firm that had about 5,000 people. 
and the CEO of the company named Raymond James called my office and he said, who is this kid? Where did he come from? Who is his father that's so rich that's given? He says, no, no father, no nothing. This is just a kid that works really hard. He goes, but how is he making money for people when all of us are losing money? We have the top research analysts in the country. We have this, we have that, do, 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 do all the different, uh, you know, reasons of why they should be making money. How come we're losing money? He's making money. He said, no, he does his research, he invests, he makes people money. Well, I don't know, he just, he works nonstop. So the uh, manager of the office, this Indian guy, did me a favor and he recorded the conversation and he let me hear it after the conversation. And uh, I was shocked because at the end of the conversation, the CEO said, listen, there has to be something wrong. Maybe he's doing something illegal. Maybe he's using insider information. He said, this kid doesn't even know what insider information is. He's so new. Just leave him alone. He goes, no, it does not, doesn't make any sense that this kid is already on the top three best brokers in the country when the average career on, a, on, on the list is 25, 30 years. He's only in it for a few years. So I realized at that point that if you're going to be part of a big company, you're going to be part of a UPS, you're going to be part of a Merrill Lynch, you're going to be part of a Bank of America or a Chase or a Coca-Cola or an Apple. You have to fit in. You have to do what they do. In Rome, you have to be a Roman. That's the way it works. Well, guess what? I'm Israeli. I don't like being a Roman. So I said, it's time for me to leave. I'm not interested in doing what they're doing. I'm interested in making people money, doing my own thing. And I left. Started my own company. And to my surprise, I actually became more, more successful because of it. My clients, who were all entrepreneurs, actually appreciated that I was an entrepreneur. And I left the big firm and started my own shop. And they started sending me more clients and more friends. And over the next year, I actually got to become more successful with a bad month was a couple of hundred thousand dollars. A good month would be over a half a million dollars. Started hiring analysts and all types of research uh, people and brokers. I had a whole slew of people that worked for me, all, some of my old friends, some of new ones. And Baruch Hashem, money was plenty. But what you discover when you get a lot of money relatively quickly is that life starts losing its meaning. Because when you don't have money, you have hope that life will be better once you have the stuff you want. You know, you want a car, but you don't, can't afford it. So once you get the car, you figure, oh, once I have the car, then I'll be happy. Okay, so you got the car. Two weeks later, whether it's a Bentley or it's a Honda Accord, doesn't really make a difference anymore. It still drives on four wheels. So you say, oh, once I get the fancy house. I live in the little rinky-dink apartment, pay $700 a month rent. Oh, who's going to be happy in such a dump? Once I get my own place in the city, then, then, then I'll be happy. So I got a place in the city on John Street. And it was a nice 1,500-square-foot uh, apartment. And it was really nice. And um, a month later, just a place. So I said, no, I have to get a bigger place, much fancier place. So I bought an apartment on Wall Street on the 35th floor with almost 2,000-square-feet apartment with a 400-square-foot balcony on the 35th floor. I mean, literally, the rich and famous. I'm on this thing, and guess what? A month later, two months later, still have a bathroom, still have a bed, still goes in and out of the door. Nothing changes. Not an ounce of happiness increases. Okay, it's cool you have this apartment that has a pool inside the building and a gymnasium bigger than this building. All this stuff is cool, but for five minutes, maybe ten, the best part was showing it to other people because they thought it was cool. But for you, you never actually use this stuff. So I, I gave a tour of the gym and the building maybe 50 times. I used it a half a time, not even a full once. I, people would come from out of town, you know, clients, and people would come visit me. Oh, they want to see the place. You live on Wall Street, it's a fancy schmancy place. There's guards and police and dogs at the door. So they want to see what's this building. It's called the House of Morgan, meaning the old former uh, headquarters of J.P. Morgan. That's where I lived. Right across the street from the New York Stock Exchange. So you could literally go out and you know, see New York Stock Exchange across the street. So there's cops and all types of stuff, and I live there. So the clients like to come see it, and I would show them the pool, and I would show them the, uh, you know, the fancy schmancy stuff in the building, and there's a bowling alley, and there is a pool table, and all types of stuff. And it would ask me, so why, you must have a lot of fun in this building. I said, no, this is actually only the 87th time I've showed it, but I've never actually used this. I never used, who has time? Well, it's time to go, go play bowling in the middle of the day. I work. 
but you like to show it. So you realize little by little that the material stuff in the world, it's fun, but it has a lifetime, a relatively short lifespan. So you start looking for your meaning, your fulfillment in other places. When the watch and the car and the house and the uh, bank account don't mean much, you start looking at it for other places. And I would invest most of my time in the business, trying to build a business, trying to build what I thought would be an empire. But even that loses its taste once in a while. So I started doing other things, started reading different philosophical books, studying different things. And then eventually I took on a hobby playing poker. I liked math. I liked gambling. And I liked uh, beating people. So that's what I would do every weekend. I didn't go work, but I went to the casino instead. Both of them, by the way, go to Gano. Just in case somebody's wondering. Maybe the guy that plays poker is okay. No, he's not, he's not allowed to play poker on Shabbat. But I thought you were allowed. I thought it's not a bad thing. I said, I figured, okay, at least I'm not working, right? So I went to the casino. I played poker with the best poker players in the world. And I won a little bit. I played some tournaments and won some more. And I actually wanted to become a poker player. I started reading books about poker. But then after a while, I started realizing that this is even worse than Wall Street. Wall Street, you know, it's people are trying to eat each other alive. In the poker world, they don't care if you're dead. They'll eat you too. You see the people, they don't leave the table. They all wear pajamas all day. Most of them are complete degenerate drug addicts. <coughs> they sit at the table waiting for some fish, waiting for some fool to come so they can take everything he owns. And they sit there and sit there and you see some of them with a newspaper and some of them have, you know, have somebody massaging them and they all look like they live there, which by the way, they do. Now all the people that some people, you know, anyone that watches this stuff on TV, you see a lot of these famous poker players and you think, wow, he must have a great life. I met them. They're all miserable. They're all drug addicts for the most part and complete degenerate losers. Why? They live in a casino. How good could life be? Casino only looks good on screen. In reality, it's the worst place on earth. Because all of the people there are people that are literally willing to bet their mother just for the next card, just for the next thing. And it makes you lose your mind, lose your sense of reality. You become desensitized, desensitized to reality, desensitized to money. You start throwing 500, 5,000, 10,000 dollar chips as if it's a piece of plastic. So after a while, I realized that, you know, maybe being a poker player is not the best idea in the world, but what else can I do? I don't really like Wall Street that much anymore, but it's a good business. I make good money in it. So I figured, okay, you know what? Maybe I'll start taking care of my health. Now, throughout all of this time, my inspiration to continue has always been my wife. My wife who helped me with the business. My wife who gave me hope. My wife, who even tried to make me a religious Jew once or twice by buying me a Tanakh and telling me that I shouldn't work on holidays. She was my inspiration to keep looking for the answer and she kept telling me, yeah, the answer, you're always going to find it in this Torah. And I never understood why she's saying it because she wasn't even Jewish. But HaKadosh Baruch Hu will send you messengers in different ways. And as we're doing this already now, this Kiruv, the speeches, the CDs, and everything else for now five, six, seven years, I realized that the last train is about to come. The last train for the generation is arriving. The last chance for everybody to do tshuva is around the corner. And the reason why is because now more than ever, everybody's getting a chance to discover the truth at least once. In the past, people would discover it in random times. You discover it maybe you found a CD somewhere or somebody invited you to their house or somebody married into a religious family. Once in a while you'd hear of somebody doing tshuva. Today, every day there's a story. Every day there's a near-death experience. Every day somebody changes their life. Every day something new comes out in the Torah world that shakes the whole world apart. Today, HaKadosh Baruch Hu is making it pretty simple, pretty clear, time's running out. I have to close the store, I have to shut down all the books, but before I do it, HaKadosh Baruch Hu is telling us, I'm going to give everybody a chance. Everyone's going to have a chance to discover the truth once and for all, and then do something about it. If you do good, you'll get good. Forever. You don't do good, the opposite. 
I got my chance a few times, but I ignored it. I got a Tanakh from a non-Jewish woman. I got a few rabbis that would come to my office at least three times a week. They'd never actually tell us anything about Torah, but they'd ask for money. They were pretty good about that. Three, four times a week, sometimes even every day. No one ever cared to tell me that I should keep Shabbat. No one ever cared to tell me that I should marry a Jew. No one ever cared to tell me that I should change my life in any way, shape, or form. But they were very, very good at asking me for money. And I hate them for it. And I talk about it all the time of how much I hate them for it. And the reason why is because if they would have told me, there's at least a 50% chance I would have listened. I can't tell you for sure I would have listened. There's a very good chance I wouldn't have listened. At least 50%. I wouldn't have listened to them and just kicked them out of my office. But if you're going to tell me that you're a so-called religious Jew, that you believe in a Kadosh Baruch Hu, and you love a Kadosh Baruch Hu, that means you have to love his children. That means that if you see one of his kids is about to be hit by a train called Gehenom because he's a Mechalel Shabbat married to a non-Jew, you should have enough care in your heart to say, hey, get out of the way. Get out of the way. You cannot do all the things that you're doing. But unfortunately, sometimes money blinds us. And when we're so busy chasing money, we forget that we're at the end of the day, HaKadosh Baruch Hu says, Liya kesef Liya zav neum Hashem tzevaot. All the money in the world is His. You're chasing it. In essence, what you're trying to do is ask HaKadosh Baruch Hu for permission for more money. If He agrees, He gives you more. If not, He, give, he doesn't give it to you. But to stop doing your job, which is publicizing the Torah, living the Torah, fulfilling the mitzvot for the sake of money, that just simply means you're trying to rob Hashem. And unfortunately, sometimes that happens from the religious, religious community. Not always, but it does happen. Yetzirah is in every one of us. So I resent those people simply because I knew that they had a lot of opportunities. How many opportunities? Well, let's do the math. I had my office for about 15 years, 16 years. But let's just do 10. Every week they would come three times, sometimes more. But let's just do one. Once a week, 52 times a year, it's 52 times. 10 years, that means it's 520 opportunities. 520 opportunities to tell me at some point, maybe not in the beginning, maybe not in the middle, but at some point in the end, when you see me about to die, which you'll find out about in a moment, at some point, you should tell me, hey, buddy, you know you should keep Shabbat. You know you should keep kosher, not kosher style. You know you should marry a Jew, not like someone that wants to be a Jew, maybe, sometimes. You know you're supposed to do stuff because HaKadosh Baruch Hu said it. And not just give tzedakah, because tzedakah is one mitzvah. We have 620. It's a good mitzvah, but if you don't fulfill the rest of them, this mitzvah is not going to really help you much. In fact, even if you do all of the mitzvot, but you skip a mitzvah called Shabbat, the rest of them are worthless. At some point, out of the 522 times, you would think, you should tell me. But they didn't. So what happens when the messengers fail? Akadosh Baruch Hu has to get involved. Now you'll find out why I don't like them so much, these people. On November 18th of 2006, I decided to take care of my health and have an elective surgery for something that bothered me once or twice a year, called hemorrhoids. Now, don't worry, two-thirds of people have it. Pregnant women have it very often, males have it, people that work out have it, many, many people have it. But don't worry, you're not going to have the same test as me, I'm very unique. At least that's what the doctors say. Now, when I went to the doctor, he told me this is a very normal case, you come in the office, uh, you come to the hospital in the morning, within an hour or two we finish the surgery, you go home, you get rest, you feel a little bit of discomfort for a couple of days, which by the way means pain, and you go back to work on Monday. I said, okay, Monday, it's a couple of days worth of work, I make about $3,000 an hour, so this surgery is costing me about a high, yeah, good, good $100,000. All right, I guess it's worth it. That's the logic of someone that is losing the meaning to life, pretty much. So I go to the surgery, and I don't wake up the same. When I wake up, I wake up screaming. I wake up yelling, and they ask me what's wrong, and I yell back at them that I feel like they're cutting me up with knives that are connected to electricity. Over and over and over again, and I start begging them and anyone that would, that's next to me to kill me. 
because it's intolerable. Obviously, they don't listen. My wife arrives. She starts seeing me screaming and yelling. She starts hysterical crying. My mother arrives. She starts hysterical crying. I ask them both to kill me. Neither one want to listen to me. And it won't stop. Eventually, the doctors start giving me more and more morphine. It doesn't work. They give me more. It doesn't work. They give me more. It doesn't work. Eventually, they tell them, listen, we gave him the most amount of morphine legally allowed. Most people would have already died from the morphine. If it doesn't work at this point, we can't do anything. Hashem at that point had, Baruch Hashem, mercy on me, and it started working. I calmed down. After I calmed down, everyone stopped sweating. I realized that I just saw a version of Gainom I never knew before. And I said, okay, can I go home now? This place is not so much fun after all. So they released me, because after all, it was an elective surgery. That was mistake number two. We got home. We had a sandwich. I told everybody good night, and I went to sleep. 45 minutes later, the morphine wore off. I started screaming, only this time it was much worse than the first time. Only this time, it didn't stop. Even though I had painkillers. Even though I took 50 of them. Even though I took everything we had. It didn't work. And they gave me more. And it didn't work. And it didn't work for 62 days. 62 days of screaming and yelling and the most amount of sleep, of consecutive sleep being no more than 15 minutes. The only thing that would calm my body down would be boiling water. Now everyone that wants to try it, I say, don't try this at home. Now you ever boil tea? You made tea before, you made coffee before. Now when it's boiling, you shouldn't put your fingers on it, right? Okay, well, the only way my body calmed down is if I dip my whole body into it. So my body would go into such massive pain that this pain would just be a different shade of pain that's better than the other pain and would calm me down for 15 minutes. So, go from Genom to Kafakela. <laughs> this would calm me down for about 15 minutes. I would fall asleep during those 15 minutes, and then the pain would start again. I'd start screaming and yelling again. And now after you don't sleep for 62 days, after you don't sleep for even 4 or 5 days, you, your body starts failing. So my body started failing. Started urinating blood, started seeing blood in my eyes, getting infections everywhere. We went to the hospital. Now, Akadosh Baruch Hu is very interesting. You see, when he wants your attention, he'll get it. When he wants your attention, he'll get it, no matter what you want. But sometimes he's a little bit upset at you. Because he tried getting your attention a few times. He sent you a message. He sent you a text message. He sent you a WhatsApp. He called you. He knocked on your door. He didn't get your attention. He never called back. So this time when he got your attention, he goes all out. So HaKadosh Baruch Hu says to Am Yisrael, If you do good, I'll give you good. He gives you 13 verses of blessing. But if you don't do good, 49 different curses we get, Hashem Yerachem. One of them is, Aster Astir Panai. HaKadosh Baruch Hu says, I'm going to hide my face. I'm going to hide, what do you mean? You have no face. How are you going to hide your face? How do you hide a face that doesn't exist? This is how you do it. Yosef HaTzadik was called Yosef HaTzadik by HaKadosh Baruch Hu. But he made a small, tiny, little minor error according to his level. Where after 10 years of being in a hole in the ground called a prison, he asked the Egyptian that he just solved his dream through Ruach HaKodesh, he told him, listen, if you remember to remember me, if you remember to remember me, tell Paro that I'm here. If you remember to remember me, he said, remember twice. HaKadosh Baruch Hu says, you're going to put your emuna in another person? Not me. For each remember, you get another year in jail. Each year, each remember, you get another year in jail. I mean, you're already in jail for 10 years for a different punishment. You're going to be in jail for another two years. Now, it says here that 
Yosef HaTzadik said, Zchartani v'yizkartani, meaning, remember to remember me, or remember to mention me. Now, when the Egyptian went in front of Paro, it says that he, velo zachar sara mashkim et Yosef v'yizkachehu, that this person didn't remember Yosef, and he forgot him. Obviously, if he, if he didn't remember, he forgot. If he didn't remember, he forgot. That's what it means. Why are you saying it twice? So there's many, the, the Chachamim go back and forth. Why this? Why that? Because of the punishment? Because he said, remember to remember me. But also this is something I had a little bit of an insight on. The Chachamim say that technically this was a punishment on Yosef HaTzadik. Why? You asked for help from an Egyptian, from a human being, which means you forgot me. So you forgot me, I'll forget you for another year. When Hashem wants to hide His face, it doesn't look good. So when I was screaming my lungs out, and the pain medicine didn't work, that was a small version of it. But then I went to the hospital, because pretty much I was dying, and we went to the emergency room, and you figure that the emergency room has good doctors. And in Manhattan, each one makes a zillion dollars, you figure that all of them know what they're doing. So I go to the doctors, and I'm screaming and yelling in an emergency room. And uh, the doctor comes in, looks at me, and decides, Mamash, it didn't make any sense. They barely even talked to me. They just decided what they are going to do. Now, usually, they ask you 500 questions. Usually, they ask the family 550 questions. Usually, they look at you with, you know very, very calm and, you know, just very careful. They don't want to hurt you even more. You're already in pain. No, here, it was like I was cattle. So the doctor decided, okay, she sent somebody. Okay, you give him a catheter. Shem Yachem, anyone that knows, Mevin Yavin. Anyone that knows what that means, it's not much fun. Now, after they do that, the doctor says, calls another five big doctors, big uh, nurses. Each one of them, okay, hold them down. Five of them hold me down, and she decides that she's going to investigate the entire surgery, open the whole surgery, without giving me any type of anesthesia, without giving me any type of anesthetic, nothing. And goes to the extent of putting the entire arm inside my body. Like I'm a puppet. Hey, Yaron, he is. Now, you guys probably heard the scream, you just didn't know it was me. The type of screams that I screamed that day, the type of pain that I felt that day, I remember like it was yesterday. It'll wake up the dead. That was another aspect of a Kadosh Baruch Hu hiding his face. When he makes the smart doctors really stupid, when he makes a human being act like an animal, This continued for some time. I went to other doctors. Each treatment would be worse than the other. After a couple of months of this adventure, eventually it's the pain started calming down. I would only have to take 20 to 25 painkillers per day just to survive, but still, nonetheless, it was better than the genome for those two months. So, body calmed down. I started going back to Wall Street. It would take me about 45 minutes or so to get to work, even though it was only about maybe a half a block away. So, for example, to walk from here to the end of the room for a normal person would take, I don't know, maybe uh, half a minute, 30 seconds. For me, it would take somewhere in the neighborhood of a half hour to 40 minutes. I had a cane. I looked like I was 900 years old, even though I was still in my 20s, 26 years old. So, some people thought that the cane was a fashion statement. So you started seeing other Wall Street guys with canes at that time. It was very, very interesting. I wanted to hit them with the cane, but I didn't have the power. You started seeing some other guys walking around with a cane all of a sudden. They thought it was a fashion statement. Like I started a fashion statement. So anyway, so this happened. I had a, a very uh, difficult time walking, running, breathing, or even tolerating anything. But nonetheless, I had hope. I figured that things are getting better. It'll continue getting better. Well, they got better for a little while. But HaKadosh Baruch Hu thought that I was going to get the message that it's time for me to say Shema Yisrael. It's time for me to change my life. I didn't get the message. So nine months later, I felt pain in my leg. By the next day, I wasn't able to move. Within a few hours, we had to go to the hospital, emergency room. 
The doctors did a short test. And they told me that I have such a big infection in between two muscles that if I would have waited another hour maximum, two would have exploded, gone into my blood system, and I would have died within hours. I said, wow, you guys are really full of good news. So they said, well, we have to do a surgery. I said, oh, I have such great experience with surgeries. But yes, okay, let's have a surgery. Now, I didn't know how bad the surgery was. I just knew the last one was really bad. It says, what? Oh, wow. Uh, oh, wow. Uh, this one, they didn't let me go. It was so bad, they didn't let me go out of the hospital. It was so bad, I couldn't leave the intensive care unit where people are dying for almost three weeks. Three weeks, I'm connected to morphine, nonstop pressing the button as if it's a video game. Talk, 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 nonstop. Now, I'm in and out of consciousness hoping that this is eventually going to be over, and then I fall asleep before I realize what I was hoping for. Eventually, this starts calming down, and uh, I figured, okay, we're done. Eventually, they release me. I go back home. Oh, Hashem. I figure, okay, the worst of it is behind. We saw Geinom. We saw Kafakela. Next time, we're going to see Gan Eden. Well, you have to go to keep Shabbat for Gan Eden. You have to keep kosher for Gan Eden. You have to learn Torah for Gan Eden. I didn't do any of those things. I just figured I have bad luck. So six months later, the other leg started hurting. I said, ah, oh, can't be. What's the chances? I mean, how bad could bad luck be? Even a broken clock is right twice a day. I mean, come on. I went to the doctor. He said, oh, it doesn't look good, sir. You have to have a surgery. I said, when? He said, immediately. Okay, so we go back to the intensive care unit. They tell me my situation is worse than I thought. The other guy was just being nice about it. I have to have the surgery immediately. I'm in the hospital for another few weeks. But this time, since I didn't get the first message or the second message, they sent me some Mexican doctor where apparently in Mexico, there's a certain type of people over there that don't have feelings for other people. So he learned his medicine from the other people that I, I met in NYU. He also decided to check me without anesthesia, without any painkillers, without anything. This was a blast, guys. You should never try it, though. So when eventually I had to, before I had to, you know, leave, they told me we have to check. So they sent me this guy, this Mexican doctor, and he decided he's going to really check. He opened the wound. He put his hands in. He started taking, oh, wow, it was a lot of fun. It was a, a blast, Kabutai. I mean, if you ever wanted to learn my shiur about Genom, this is a little worse. Why? HaKadosh Baruch Hu said, if you don't do tshuva, you don't do what I say, I'm going to hide my face. Why? All the smart people become stupid. All of the things that make sense don't make sense. The world goes upside down. Why? I'm trying to get your attention. You didn't listen the easy way. You didn't listen to the shiur way. You didn't listen to the CD. You didn't listen to the WhatsApp message. You didn't listen to all the other things. So I got to get your attention in an unfortunately hard way. So I still didn't get the message because I figured I just have bad luck and bad health. So now three months later, I'm back in the hospital. Another surgery. And then two months later, I'm back in the hospital. Another surgery. And then every month, every month I'm in the hospital. My business starts going down the tubes. The market starts collapsing. My investments start collapsing. My friends become enemies. Anything and everything they can do, they can start taking as if they're all vultures. They take whatever they could just to survive, because the line is down. Business starts going downhill. Investment starts going downhill. I can't even work. I can't even protect myself. Life becomes hell. Literally. And now I get to a point where I have to go to the hospital every month, and that's not even enough. So I start going to doctors on a regular basis. Every week I have at least two to three doctor's appointments. Every week we're trying a new doctor. We tried over 50 different specialists from everywhere of every type of trade, regular, holistic, traditional medicine, all types of things. I even got to a point, we were so desperate, I joined a study. I became a part of an experiment. They started injecting my body four or five times a week with ozone just to see if something will happen to my body. Maybe I'll purify, maybe I'll die. Figure 50-50 chance. And I became a part of an experiment. And he started, you know, writing down, okay, so you didn't really act so well today. Well, tough luck, kid. 
so this was our only hope. I started taking steroids like the athletes. I had a lot of money. So every shot, $1,500. Every day, a few times a day. Maybe that will work. All I got is side effects. Started going to different types of doctors. They started saying, maybe it's a nervous problem. Maybe you have a nerve issue. So they started giving me nervous medicine. All types of drugs that affect your brain. Well, after about a couple of hours of taking one of those drugs, I started thinking and contemplating what would happen if I run into moving traffic. And I started contemplating suicide. And I didn't understand why do I want to commit suicide. I'm not happy, but I'm not depressed. And then I asked my wife, honey, can you look at that medicine? Does it say anything about side effects? She says, why? I said, I don't know. For some reason, I'm starting to contemplate vision vivid imagination my vivid imagination is starting to picture me running into moving traffic me jumping off of a building and i don't know i woke up this morning fine just after i met this doctor he gave me this new medicine i'm starting to commit want to commit suicide so she started going into a panic she looked at it she says yes that's the first side effect i said okay so finish with that one and we tried all types of medicine but the medicine didn't work this continued on for over seven years Seven years, every dollar that I had was going out the window. The friends became enemies. The doctors pre became pretty much a uh, permanent part of my life. And little by little, I started realizing that I don't really want to live anymore. Now, Kadosh Baruch Hu, even though sometimes his message is harsh, sometimes his message is painful, at the end of the day, if he's still giving you a message, that means he loves you. Because if he didn't, there wouldn't be a message. There would just be a conclusion. So he gives you a test that you can handle, even though you don't agree. But at some point, you break. And at that breaking point, or right before that breaking point, that's where HaKadosh Baruch Hu gets involved. When Am Yisrael got to Yam Suf, they got to the Sea of Reeds, everybody started breaking. Why? On one end, they have an ocean that doesn't end. Behind them, they have an enemy with an army that's so big, it doesn't end. On the right and left are scorpions and snake that the Midrash says were the size of humans. Anaconda snakes that were the size of 10, 20, 30 people. They would eat people alive. So you couldn't go in a desert just roaming around. You couldn't go back to Egypt because they kill you. And then the ocean, who knows how to swim? We've been slave for 200 years. So people started breaking. Some say, okay, so let's maybe ask forgiveness. We'll become slaves again. The other, the other one says, let's fight them. Let's fight. Let's at least fight. They're going to kill us, but let's fight at least. People started breaking. But there was a person by the name of Nachshon ben Aminadav from the tribe of Yehuda. He did a kalvachom. He did a needless to say. He did a little calculation in his head using his Jewish brain. He said, figure this. HaKadosh Baruch Hu just destroyed the biggest civilization in the world for who? For us. All these miracles, 10 plagues, making the water into blood, making the frogs come, all types of wonderful things for, oh, for us. He made the slave into the master. For what? So we could get here. For what? I don't know yet. But obviously it's not to kill us. If he wanted to kill us, he would just leave us in Egypt. So we're here for a reason. He heard Moshe say to Hashem, Hashem, please help us. Hashem says to him, Mati what are you screaming to me for? Ravla, move forward. Move forward. We'll move forward with what? Show me you believe in me. Show me that you actually have taken your emunah into action. And not just say, I have emunah, I have emunah, I have emunah. As soon as you have a test, all the emunah goes into the garbage. Nachshon ben Aminadav got this message. He says, I have emunah. I'm going to show I have emunah. I'm going to go into the ocean. Why? It's the only way that doesn't have 100% death. Scorpion snakes, for sure. Egyptians, for sure. The water, we're not so sure. We just don't know how to swim yet, though. So he goes into the water. The water covers his face, even over his nose. And at that very moment, when he wasn't able to handle the test anymore because he was dying, he was drinking, drinking the water, drowning, Akados Baruch Hu split the ocean. Akados Baruch Hu is willing to split the ocean for every single Jew. All you got to do is put your amunah into action. But sometimes you don't know what you don't know. Sometimes you don't even know where to start. So HaKadosh Baruch Hu has to help you through a messenger. One messenger that I had was my wife. 
she gave me a Tanakh, she tried recommending different types of things for me to learn in order for me to be a religious Jew, even though she wasn't Jewish. But my other messenger was my mom. My mother, God bless her, she is a very spiritual woman. She has some very interesting dreams that never made sense to me my whole life, but they start to make more and more sense the more I learn Torah, because many of them have a lot to do with the Torah. She knew that her son is in danger. She knew that her son was dying. She would go to all types of rabbis, and she only told me a lot of the stuff after the fact. She would go to a lot of different rabbis and ask them for bracha, bracha, bracha. She had a phone book full of rabbis. Please, my son is dying. Bracha, bracha. She'd go to Israel. She'd go to this place. She'd go to that place. She went to a very big mekubal in Netanya named Rav Amos. Rav Amos is one of the mekubalim. He's been there, Baruch Hashem, for many, many years. And Rav Amos doesn't usually see women. But, Baruch Hashem, my mom started hysterical crying and got everybody's attention in the middle of the night. And Rav Amos didn't need her to explain what was happening. She was crying, my son, please help my son, he's dying. He looked at her and apparently, whether he has Ruach HaKodesh or not, I don't know. All I know is that he had the solution. We just didn't want to listen. He said, your son has a big neshama, but the only thing that's going to help him is a big tshuva. Now how is your mom going to tell you to go do tshuva if you went to public school? How is your mom going to tell you to go do tshuva if right now you're married to a non-Jew? How is your mom going to tell you to go do tshuva if you don't even know what you don't know? So my mom tried to give me different things, different ways, different to get me in. Give me a tailing book, give me a blessing book, give me all types of things, but I never took it seriously. Until I had no choice. After about seven years of this hell, I got to a point where I realized I don't want to be in this world, so... I'm going to start thinking about leaving, exiting. But at least because I care about these people, let me be nice to them. Be extra nice to my wife, be extra nice to my mom. So I decided to call my mom and say hello, but I'm hearing her hysterical crying. She's crying hysterically. I say, Ima, what's wrong? She says, please talk to him. Talk to him, please. I said, ooh, and who's making you cry? She says, Ephraim. I said, who's this Ephraim? Who's this Ephraim? Why is he making you cry? She goes, it's your cousin. He's from Israel. Please talk to him. I said, if it's going to stop you from crying, have him call me. I'll do whatever you want. I didn't know who Ephraim was. I didn't even know I had a cousin named Ephraim. Because when I left Israel, he was still a baby. But Ephraim was the next messenger. I get a phone call from an Israeli number. I answer the phone. And Ephraim starts the conversation tells me who he is, and starts telling me, he says, you like stories? I said, sure. He starts telling me a story. Later on, I find out the characters in the story of Yudai and Tamar, from the Torah. And he starts telling me the story of Yudai and Tamar, and how the whole thing happened, of how Yuda had two sons, or three sons. First son, Er you know, was married to Tamar, but he wasted seed, so Hashem killed him, because Hashem hates wasting seed, even before Matan Torah. Then there was Onan. Onan also wasted seed, so Hashem killed him also, because Hashem hates it also. He still hated it the first time. He hates it the second time. From there we learn also, by the way, that wasting seed is a sin both for Jews and non-Jews. Not just for Jews, because the law was already in play even before Matan Torah. We actually learn it originally from Noach. Motzi dam ma'adam ba'adam. Damo yishapech. Someone that spills blood of a man within a man, his blood will be spilled. Blood of a man within a man. Obviously, it's not blood. If it's blood of a man, then we know it's blood regular. Bl blood of a man within a man, that means the essence of blood. The, the thing that's the even de bigger than blood, which is seed. So now, Rabotai Karim, Ephraim, Rabbi Ephraim is telling me the story of how these two guys wasted seed. And then Tamar knew through prophecy that Mashiach is coming from Shevet Yehuda, and she wanted to be a part of it, of this big mitzvah, so she pretended to be a prostitute. So Yehuda would be with her. And I said, why would Hashem do such a thing? He says, because the Yetzirah knows that as soon as the Mashiach actually comes, Hashem is going to slaughter him. So he's going to try to do everything and anything to ruin it. So Hashem has to make anything that has to do with Mashiach look really, really ugly. 
the first look of all the stories connecting to Mashiach, you'll see him, first impression, look upside down, look really ugly. Lot, with his two daughters, Yehuda and Tamar, David HaMelech and Batsheva, and so on and so forth, all these different stories in the Torah that have to do with Mashiach, all look upside down. Why? Because HaKadosh Baruch Hu wants to bring the salvation, but not in a very natural way. The point being, Rabotai, is that he's telling me the story. I found it very fascinating. And he said, you want another story? And I said, yes. Long story short, we talked for an hour and 40 minutes. I like the conversation. I hope for another one. He says, can I call you next week? I said, sure. So, next week, Thursday, 4 o'clock, he calls me. He start, I start asking him questions. He gives me answers. But what kind of answers? He gives me fantastic answers. Answers I've always been looking for. I've always had questions, but nobody had answers. I'd ask people, does the Torah believe in dinosaurs? One guy said yes, one guy said maybe, and the other one said no. I said, so one of you is a liar, one of them maybe is right, and the other one is just doesn't show what he's doing. Like, how could it be that you have three different answers? Can somebody show me? Can somebody show me an answer of yes, yo, something, whichever one it is? Baruch Hashem, Rabbi Fahim was a personal messenger, had the answer with a source. He says, Torah says that there is dinosaurs. It's called Taninim Agdolim. Taninim Agdolim means huge reptiles, which is literally is what dinosaurs are. It's in, a, it's in the Torah, fourth day. So I started getting answers with sources. And then I would ask another question about business. He said, well, this is a fantastic question. Rabbi so-and-so asked the same question 890 years ago in this book, on this page, and this time, and I said to myself, what are the chances that he has the book in front of him? And he remembers which page, 800 years ago, so I just asked another question. I didn't really care about the other question. I just wanted to see if he has that book too. And I asked him another question, and he said, fantastic question. And I was proud of myself of asking fantastic questions. He said, yeah, see, Rabbi such and such asked the same question 450 years ago in this book, on this page, on this line, as if I know what he's talking about. This book, I never heard of the book or the rabbi. But I knew I asked a fantastic question. I felt good about myself. But I didn't know where is he getting these answers from, meaning how does he have all these books in front of him? So I asked him, how do you have all these books in front of you? He says, I don't have the books in front of me. We didn't have Skype yet. It was actual real phone call. He says, how do you have all the... He says, I don't have all the books in front of me. He says, how do you know all these answers? He goes, that's what you do when you learn Torah. You learn Torah, and a Baruch will give you answers, and you have the answers in the books. And that's when I... The, something clicked, where I realized, he's not, my, he's not normal. Not to me. My life, I was surrounded by other types of people. This is not normal to me. Why? He knows books by heart. He knows lots of them by heart. He knows answers and people and names, all types of wonderful things. I like this. I'm going to continue this. Can we have another conversation next week? Next week, Thursday, 4 o'clock, 5-hour conversation. Same thing. Conversation, questions, answers, everything, 5 hours straight, no break. Next week, Thursday, 4 o'clock, 7-hour conversation. I didn't even know how many questions I had until I started asking them and getting questions. Anyone that didn't get answers in their life, you should try it. It's mamash unbelievable. Unbelievable to get answers to life's questions. But if you really care about the question, not just because you want to know the answer. Ask questions you care about. I started getting them. And I started caring more about this than what was happening in my life. The pain was agonizing. I didn't care. The money was being lost literally faster than I made it. I didn't care about it. Life was going upside down. I cared less. Why? Thursday, 4 o'clock, that's my answer day. That's the day I get answers. After doing this for about nine months, got a lot of answers. Rabbi Fahim saw that I'm changing my life, saw that I'm starting to fall in love with the Torah. I'm starting to learn even more than the Thursday, 4 o'clock, 7-hour session. And he started telling me that I have to change certain things. So I said, what's the first thing I should change? He said, you have to start keeping Shabbat. I said, yeah, I don't work on Shabbat. I just go to the casino. <laughs> he says, exactly. You're not allowed to go to the casino. I said, why not? He says, because going to the casino is stealing. I said, no, I'm not stealing from the casino. I'm just playing other players poker. He goes, exactly. What you do is 100% stealing. I said, why is it stealing? He says, because you play against another person. He said, yeah. Now, sometimes the other person loses. He says, yeah, exactly. That's the whole objective, for him to lose. 
He says, yeah, but when he loses, he gives you the money. I said, exactly, that's the best part. He says, that's exactly the worst part. I said, why? He doesn't really want to give you the money. He said, yeah, but that's the rules. He says, it doesn't matter what the rules are. The reality is, he's giving you the money against his will. He doesn't want to give you the money. The minute he gives you the money, even though there was rules that you both agreed to, the minute he gave you the money, it's, it's considered 100% stealing. Gezel. You have a serious problem with Hashem. I said, I don't want to have a problem with Hashem. He tortured me already for a while. So I stopped gambling. And then I said, okay, so what else can I do on Shabbat? He says, on Shabbat you learn Torah. I said, I learned it the rest of the week. I said, no, no, Shabbat you learn even more. I said, okay, fine. So I'll start keeping Shabbat. Now in the beginning, you don't really know what you don't know. So you start doing things. He said, oh, there's Onik Shabbat. He told me to make sure to celebrate Shabbat. So I'd say, no, I like certain foods, so let's make salads on Shabbat. And you know what? I like tomatoes. I like tomato pears. So I started grinding tomatoes on Shabbat. I'm thinking it's much fresher. It's much fresher if you make it on Shabbat. I didn't know it's not allowed to grind on Shabbat. So in the beginning, I didn't really know much. I would start telling them during the week. I'm like, oh, wow, I had some fantastic sauce on Shabbat with the jachnun, with the this, with the that. He goes, what do you mean you had the sauce? You, you made the sauce? I said, yeah. He goes, when did you make the sauce? I said, of course, right before I ate it on Shabbat. He said, okay, I'm going to send you a book. So he sends me a book, and I say, I guess I'm surprised to see the book. And what's the book? It's a kid's book, a children's book. It's a children's book called 39 Melachot. 39 laws of Shabbat, 39 restrictions of Shabbat, with a bunch of pictures. And I asked him, like, are you kidding me, or is this for children? He says, no, no, this is going to teach you Shabbat better than another book is going to teach you. From there I learned that he knew his student. Why? He knew I didn't know. I knew I didn't know. And the reality is, if you give me a book, you give me a Shuchan Aruch, you give me Yalkut Yosef on day one, I'm going to say thank you, but no thank you. I want to read 500 page book. By the time I finished, I'm going to be Mashiach already. No, I need, I need to know now. So you give me a children's book to learn Alachot Shabbat. That's when I discovered the importance of knowing your students. The Ramban writes to his son, Shma Beni Musar Avicha. The Ramban writes to his son, My dear son, hear the Musar, hear the lessons of your father. Now the lessons of Musa sometimes are a little bit of a pinch. You tell somebody that uh, they violate Shabbat, it's a death penalty, it's not exactly good news. You tell somebody that if they gamble, it's considered stealing, it's not exactly nice to hear. So Musa is not always pleasant to hear, but it's true. That's the most important. But the Ramban says, Shma, Shma Beni Musa Ravicha, listen to the Musa of your father. Why? Because if you're going to tell somebody Musar, if you're going to tell somebody the truth, you always have to remember, at the end of the day, even though you're rebuking him, even though you're telling him things that are a little bit hard to hear, you have to remember, you have to act with a little bit of love like you're his father. Because if you're just insulting people constantly, no, 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 rasha, da, da, then eventually they're say, listen, you're just an abusive person, leave me alone. Uh, I don't even want to know the truth anymore. So you have to show a little bit of love. So when I saw this children's book, I realized that, yes, it's not fun for me to have to change my life, but the fact that he knows his student's limitation, his own student's limitations, shows me some love, shows me that he cares. This is a person that makes maybe, maybe on a good month, 1,500 shekels, which is $400 a month, and he decided to take some money and spend it on me, on writing, buying me this book. And that's when I realized also that when you're a Baal Tshuva, when you're a convert, when you're new, the old traditional way of teaching people, teaching people has always been you learn from childhood. You learn from childhood, you go to yeshiva, they teach you, they want you to, uh, to like, the, let's say, the Aleph Bet, and you're only three, four years old, they put some honey on the letters, so every time you, uh, you get a good letter, then you could uh, have a little bit of taste of honey, beautiful. This generation is not the same. This generation, the kid gets an Aleph Bet and he wants an iPod. He gets, a, he gets a good grade in math, he wants a car, even though he doesn't know how to drive yet. This generation is a little bit different. So by the time we actually start learning to us, sometimes we're adults. Sometimes we're not five years old. Sometimes we're 35 years old. Now, if you start teaching the 35 years old like he's 35, guess what? He's not going to learn anything because he doesn't understand all the preliminary things. 
So if you're going to teach a Baal Tshuva or a convert the beginning, the basics of Judaism, you have to teach them like a child. You have to assume they know nothing. And even if you have to show them pictures. Now my dear friend Rav Golan actually put this book together that I think is one of the greatest things that you can possibly do for this generation, this Baal Tshuva generation. And Baruch Hashem, they're doing it in multiple languages. Bezat Hashem, in the next couple of months, this will be published and sold. But they put this book together in multiple languages, in Chinese, in Spanish, in English, obviously. And they're teaching you, welcome to Judaism. Meaning, learn the basics, basics of Judaism. But there's a lot of Jews. There's How to Become a Jew is a fantastic book for how to become a Jew. There's a lot of other books that are going to tell you the basics of Judaism. What's the difference? Most of them are for adults. Most of them are just text. We need pictures. Why? Because we're brand new. I need to know what does it mean? What does it mean don't grind? What does it mean don't winnow? What does it mean all of these 39 restrictions? What does it mean that you dime? Where do I put the cup after I finish? Do I put it in the sink? Do I put it uh, in a closet? Can I just uh, use any cup? I need to see stuff. Why? Because we're children. When you're about tshuva, you're literally a child. So, Baruch Hashem, the Chachamim put something together and they literally have pictures along with every single law. So you can have a little bit of a understanding, a visual, a visual of what's going on. Not because you're not smart, but just because you're late. You're late to the show. You only start to do Tshuva at 25, at 35, at 45, and you don't know what you don't know. So they put a book together that's going to show you some pictures of what a Jew is supposed to look like. And I think it's a fantastic, fantastic thing, uh, fantastic chesed for Am Yisrael. Anyone that's a Baal Tshuva, anyone that's a convert has always been looking for one particular book that's going to cover the Aleph Bet of Judaism. It doesn't cover everything, but it covers just enough to get through the day. Know enough to be a Jew. This is one of the things that my rabbi did, but it was many books. He would send us literally children's books to start learning Torah. After a while of doing this, I started learning that there's other books. I started falling in love with it, and I started learning more and more. But then one day, he dropped the next bomb on me. And he told me that he has a chidush. Chidush means a new insight. What's this chidush? He says, I just learned in the Zohar that Rabbi Meir Balanes says that a person will lose all of his money if he's married to a goya. Now, at this point, I didn't really keep my cool like I'm keeping now. At this point, I lost my temper. Why? Number one, I don't know who this Rabbi Meir is yet. I don't know who this Rabbi Meir is. I didn't know he was able to revive the dead, and he's from 2,000 years ago, and he was a student of Rabbi Akiva, and he's Kodesh Kodeshim, and Allah Haki Rabbi Meir. I didn't know all that stuff. I just knew some guy named Rabbi Meir is telling me my life is wrong, my wife is wrong, everything is wrong. What does he know about himself? And he's blaming her. What does she have to do with me losing money? So I lost my mind. I said, oh, this Rabbi Meir doesn't know what he's talking about. Hashem, I like what I said. And Rabbi Fahim says, listen, this is what it says. And he starts showing me the text. And I said, so what do I do? He says, well, you have a couple of options. One, she can convert. I said, there's conversions? That's how little we knew. I said, the people can convert to Judaism? He says, actually, Rabbi Meir comes from converts. Rabbi Meir comes from converts. His rabbi, Rabbi Akiva, also comes from converts. Their rabbis, rabbis, Shmaya and Aftalion, were converts themselves. Itro, Matan Torah, the greatest convert alive. The greatest convert in his time. The great, one of the greatest converts in history. Itro, Parashat Itro, is Matan Torah. Vaishma Itro. Ruth, Mashiach comes from her. Convert. He says, converts are a fantastic thing in Judaism. So I said to her, oh, honey, you want to convert? She said, sure, what do you have to do? So we started learning, what do you have to do? She said, oh, oh, hold on a second. Well, how do I stop believing what I believe? I said, what do you believe? And she started telling me she believes that some guy died 2,000 years ago and he's a nice person. I said, okay, so just stop believing it. She said, you can't just stop believing something. You can't just stop believing in it. So why do you, how do you get somebody to stop believing something? The answer is you have to prove them that what they believe is false. So that's what we started learning. We started learning about Christianity. Little by little we learned about Christianity and started realizing that Christianity is not only man-made, but it's literally the biggest scam in history. 
to such an extent that you have over two and a half billion people today are 100% idol worshippers without even knowing it for the most part. They created a religion from nothing. They created a religion by piggybacking over other idol worship. And they're fooling people left and right to believe that you don't have to do anything to go to heaven because some moron died 2,000 years ago. Now the beautiful part about our Torah is that it's also the best history book in his, in, ever. So our sages wrote everything down, put everything down, and we even have the history of the Goim. We even have the history of what happened back then. And you can find the real true story about Jesus in our Torah, in the Talmud, in the Gemara. And we started learning it, and I started showing all these different things, like, yeah, maybe this is your opinion, maybe this is his opinion, so I had to find out more. And little by little, I started learning more and more about this. And I fell into a debate that Rabbi Mizrahi, Rabbi Yosef Mizrahi, she put together against a Christian professor. And I thought that this is the greatest debate. Out of all the things that I watched, this was the greatest debate. I convinced her to watch the first couple of parts. But unfortunately, it wasn't enough. Then later on, I found some other things that were interesting, but that wasn't enough. But it got to a point where she realized there's something wrong. There's something wrong with her religion. There's something wrong with our life. There's something wrong with everything. We discovered another video called Torah and Science. And Torah and Science, also by Rabbi Mizrahi, has three parts. We watched part one. We were both fascinated that you could actually prove that God exists. Scientifically. Not just rationally, not just wishful thinking, not just I hope it works out, but actually prove it literally. And it was fascinating to us that you could see this. So then we wanted to watch part two, but it, part two didn't work, so we watched part three. Part three fascinated us even more. But at the end of the second video, she got to a different stage than I did. I was fascinated, I was on cloud nine, but she realized something she realized that we can't stay together. She realized that a Jew and a Gentile are not allowed to be together. And if we stay together, we're both doomed. Because at some point along the line, we heard one of the rabbis say, it was actually Rabbi Mizrahi, that we had a dog. And we liked our dog. And one time I said in passing to my rabbi, I'm like, you know, I think my dog used to be a human being because he has such a great personality. And my rabbi said, well, it's possible. I said, what do you mean it's possible? He said, well, there's something called reincarnation. And he started teaching me about reincarnation where there's a Gilgul. Somebody dies, they come back. Hashem uh, tries to give them another opportunity to rectify their sins. But sometimes they meet such a grave sin, they come back in lower form. They were a Jew, they come back as a Gentile. They were a Jew, they come back as a cow, as a dog, as a plant, as a rock. Scary stuff. Now Lisa talks about it. Ooh, what? You don't want to mess with him. Now, I learned that this is actually possible. I thought, I thought it was very interesting. But then I hear Rabbi Mizrahi say something that shocked my life. He says, the Gemara says, that if a Jew is intimate, intimate, not even married, intimate with a non-Jew, she'll be glued to him like a dog. So I asked my rabbi, what does this mean? She'll be glued to him like a dog? He says, well, he comes back like a dog. So now my wife overheard this. We saw the first couple of videos. She realized, okay, this is real. This is not good. If we stay together, something bad's going to happen to him. So she talked to Hashem. She said, Hashem, I know you're real. I know Judaism is real. I know everything is real. I just don't know if you want me to convert. I don't know if I'm allowed to convert. Even though the rabbi showed me, even though this psukim in the Torah 36 different times shows how much Hashem loves converts, to such an extent it's even more love than a natural born Jew, that a Jew actually has to love a convert as much as he loves Hashem, the Rambam says, all types of wonderful things. But Hashem, I need a sign. Now I know I'm not allowed to ask you for a sign, but I need a sign. So if you can give me a sign, good. If not, just kill me. Because I don't want him to come back like a dog. 
Because I know he's not going to leave me, and I know I'm not going to leave him, so either kill me or give me the sign. Quite a prayer. The next morning, she wakes up. I was up all night studying, learning, and I finally found part two of this Torah and Science video. And even though she wasn't exactly in the greatest moods I've ever remembered her in, I convinced her to watch part two. In part two of the video, Rabbi Mizrahi shows something called Torah codes. Torah codes are hidden secrets within the Torah that are not literal. Meaning, you can read the Torah and you can get different understandings from different things. What the story says, if you will. What the hidden halacha within it. What's the law within it. What is the principle behind it. But also, there is something even more, which is called sod. Different secrets within it. And there's different forms of these secrets. Sometimes it's because a certain word is spelled a certain way with uh, one less yud, one more yud, uh, one uh, aleph, no aleph, all types of things. But then there's an additional secret that the Chachamim knew, but was only developed in recent history, the last maybe 50, 60 years. One of the big innovators in Torah codes is Professor Rips. And he discovered many, many secrets that you can see in the Torah that not only show that the Torah was actually written by God, but also that the Torah has every bit of information that will ever exist from the beginning of the world all the way to the end, including everything that ever happened, whether it be the Holocaust, or it be the pogroms and inquisitions, or it be Hitler and all of his friends, or it could be today, Donald Trump, this lecture, everything and anything you want, you could actually find in the Torah, you just not need to know how to look and what to look for. So in the Torah, in the book of Deuteronomy, at the end of the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 29, I believe it is, HaKadosh Baruch Hu says to Am Yisrael that because we sin so much, the punishment is going to be that He's going to send us to the four corners of the world. He's going to send us to the four corners of the world, but in those corners, instead of us doing tshuva, initially we're going to get worse before we get better. Like the Oa Chaim HaKadosh says, that even though we were in the 49th level of Tum'ah in Mitzrayim, before Mashiach comes, we'll get to the 50th level. Meaning the generation before Mashiach will actually be the worst generation in history. Similar to Sodom and Gomorrah. I don't think anybody's going to debate we're about there. Now Rabotai Ekrim HaKadosh Baruch Hu says that in these four corners of the world we're going to get worse. What are we going to do? We're going to start worshipping the God of stone and the God of wood. So Rabbi Mizrahi says this is very logical. God of stone, Mecca, where the Muslims pray is Mecca. What do they pray around? This huge square stone. They don't pray to Yerushalayim. They want Yerushalayim, but they don't pray to Yerushalayim. They like Mecca, that's their, uh, that's their place. That's the stone. God of stone, that represents Islam. Wood represents the cross. Jesus, the, uh, the, the Noef, the, uh, the, 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 the uh, womanizer, he, what did he do? He was hung on a, on, a wooden, uh, on a wooden cross. Now, initially when we first heard this, I'm like, oh, this is a nice translation, but what's the proof? So then he brings the Torah codes. And he says, if you look at the Pasuk, in chapter 28, actually, he says that you'll see that in this, in this actual verse, you will see both the name Jesus, Yeshu, Yimach and the name Mecca inside this verse. It's the only place in the entire Torah that you find both, both of these names in one verse, and even more so, it's inside a verse that talks about them. The God of wood, the God of stone. Now it mentions several places in the Torah, it mentions the God of wood and God of stone. But this is the only place that it mentions these two specific names. So for me, I thought it was a very interesting code. I've seen other codes before, because I was studying regularly at this point. But for her, that was the sign. That was the sign of all signs. At that moment, she says, I want everything. I want to convert. I'm going to be a Jew. I'm going to be the best Jew I could possibly be. This is it. I said, okay, well, you know, we have to learn more. I said, no, no, just tell me what I need to learn. I want to do everything. So we called Rabbi Ephraim, very, very excited. He says, great, let's talk to the Bed Dean. Baruch Hashem, we connected which Bed Dean? The Bed Dean of Queens. 
הרב אליהו בן חיים, הרב גולן, ברוך השם. We called them, we started talking to them, we met with them several times, ברוך השם, everything went, for, went well, we met, we studied, we got letters together, ברוך השם, we've already been studying already for a few years, ברוך השם, everything worked out really well. Now, the last part is to actually convert. One day, Bet Din says, okay, you are going to be ready to convert on such and such date, and we are excited as can be. Problem is, that according to Allah, if you are a man and you're a woman and you're not married, you're not, to, not allowed to live in the same house. So we planned that since we're trying to be kosher here, what are we going to do? We're going to get married on the same day. Same day of conversion, finish the conversion, go to the hotel, get dressed and get chupah and kiddushin. Have the chupah right away just to make sure that we're as kosher, especially on day one. We didn't even want a wedding. Family said, no, let's have a wedding, let's delay. I said, no delay, I already made enough sins in my life. Shemi Yachem Please, I want to start doing good things. I want to start doing good things. It was very hard for me to get to this point. And the reason why was because everything I just told you was the opposite of logic, was the opposite of my life. I was Mr. Wall Street, I was Mr. Money, I was Mr. Smart Guy. I thought I knew everything. But once I started learning Torah, I knew I knew nothing. I would start learning, I'd fall asleep in five minutes. I start keeping a mitzvah, it would be so difficult for me. Some people tell me it was so difficult for me to do tshuva, it's so difficult for me to read, it's so difficult for me to do this, it's so difficult for me to do that. Well, let me give you a little bit of peace of mind so you can show it to you how difficult it was for me. So maybe you could relate. I went to the Shil Torah. The whole day I was ready for the Shil Torah. I was, going to, I was living in the city. I was excited for the Shil Torah, Rabbi Pinto. Yeshaya uh, Pinto was given a shield Torah. I believe it was Tuesday nights. I was as excited as can be to go to the shield Torah. Now there's a lot of people coming, Baruch Hashem. I sit down, he comes, he sits down, he starts talking. I find it interesting, I fall asleep. How long? Five minutes. Five minutes was all I can handle. Next week I said, okay, this time I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sleep a little bit. I'm going to rest. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. I'm going to stay up. Five and a half minutes. Couldn't last one five and a half minutes. Next week, six minutes. Next week, six and a half minutes. I just can't stay the whole hour, the whole two hours. I keep falling asleep. So I said, okay, let me just learn from books. Book, one minute. I read the whole, finally I finish the page. I finally finish a page. I don't remember what I read. I don't remember what I, I don't know what he's talking. Where, who's against who? Who's Abaye? Who's Rava? Who are these people? Why are they arguing? Why can't they just be friends? I don't understand what's going on. Then my rabbi tells me, listen, I think you need to start learning Gemara. I said, Gemara? I don't know anything. He says, learn Gemara. I said, okay. And you know, so he got me a Gemara. It would take me six and a half hours, six and a half hours for one daf, for one page in the Gemara. And by the time I finished the page, I still don't know 90% of what I said. 90% of what happened. But six and a half hours, that's how hard it was for me. Now, remember I told you that my mom, my messenger, has interesting dreams. But one day, when things were really bad, there was a hurricane here. And we were in Manhattan, and Manhattan went underwater. So after four days of being in my apartment, with no water, no electricity, they told us that we have to evacuate. So we left Manhattan, we went to Staten Island, where my parents are, and my business was going to garbage. My friends no longer existed. My health was in a toilet. The only thing I had going for me was Rav Ephraim. I started learning with them. I started liking what I was learning, but I was as upset as you can possibly be. And I just broke down. Just started breaking down because my whole life was just collapsing. My mom at that moment told me she had a dream. I said, what's the dream? She said, in my dream, in my dream, I saw you, you were just like you, but you were a little boy version of you. But you were surrounded by a bunch of beasts, by a bunch of mazikim, by a bunch of creatures that were trying to kill you. And I kept telling you, come with me, let's go to the light, come. And I start crying to her. I said, Ima, I can't. I can't do it. 
I can't do it. I just can't do it. And she would start screaming and she's crying in the dream and I'm crying in a dream and I'm surrounded by these things and they want to kill me and I can't leave. And she's not letting go and she wants me to come. Eventually I hold her hand and Baruch Hashem she says that the dream ended up good where we ended up going to this light. Now when I first heard this dream it didn't mean anything to me. Once I started learning Gemara, once I started learning interesting things in the Torah, I realized that every single time that a person sins, it's not just a sin that's for naught. It's not the sin that just goes away. It's not a cold, it's not gas, it's not breath. A sin creates something. That something is something that doesn't go away. It's called a mazik. It's called something that you definitely don't want in your life. If you make certain sins, they make one type of mazik. If you make many sins, you make many of them. But there are specific sins like wasting seed, for example, that create millions of them. Now, why do you have to care about this? The reason why is because this is one of the reasons why people have a hard time doing tshuva. It's not that you're stupid. It's not that you don't understand. It's not that you're incapable. It's not that you weren't brought up religious. It has nothing to do with it. It only has to do with the sins that you have. Once you start doing tshuva for them, that tshuva, those mitzvot that you do will start destroying those mazikim. And all of a sudden, you're going to start understanding what you read. All of a sudden, you're going to start remembering what you read. All of a sudden, you're going to want to do what you're doing. All of a sudden, you're going to fall in love with a kadosh baruch Hu. All of a sudden, you want to be a Jew. You want to put a keep on. You want to put everything on. You want to be Mordechai, Yehudi, with payers all the way to the ground. Why? Because you got rid of the enemies. So for all of the people that are having a hard time with the books, with the classes, with the CDs, with everything, my only suggestion is this. Continue. Don't let go. You just got to go through the hurdle. You got to go through the hurdle, the tough part. You got to make Torah a permanent part of your day-to-day -day life. 15 minutes a day is how I started. Eventually you got more. Then it's 30 minutes, then it's a half hour, then it's an hour, and so on and so forth. One day a woman calls us and she tells us that she wants to abort her baby. I said, please come to my house, we'll talk to you. Aborting a baby is not allowed in Judaism. Now she starts talking, okay, I'm thinking that I'm going to convince her with Torah laws and Torah codes and Torah this and Torah that. The woman's not buying it. My wife got blessed that she understands people better than I do sometimes. She says to the woman, see this. He says, listen, you're a Jew, we're Jews. You believe in Hashem, we believe in Hashem. Unfortunately, your struggle is that you think that Hashem gave you this mitzvah to have a baby, but he's going to starve the baby. So let's do this. We'll pay for the baby. Have the baby, and if you're missing any money, we'll pay for the baby. I'm looking at my wife, I said, thinking that you, we declared bankruptcy last month. We have zero money. Where are you going to pay for this baby? I'm, I'm not saying a word, but I'm thinking to myself, I'm looking at my wife, and then I raise, wait, there's something called bitachon. There's something called confidence in a kadosh baruch And this is how we've been living our life. Trying to help different people for different things without any rhyme or reason of why other than a kadosh baruch wants it done. We started a program a month and a half ago to get the kids in our community in, Fl in Florida to start coming to the shul. How? Convince them with money. We paid them $15 to come for shul Torah. Why? There's no other way to get them to come. But guess what? Two people came, four people came, six people came. On Sunday, we had 25, 26 kids, 18-year-olds that we would never meet. Baruch Hashem, already half of them started doing tshuva. Already half of them. Why? They stopped sinning. They started learning. Little by little, Baruch Hashem, you're creating a revolution. There are people in India, in India, in a third world country, not even talking about where there's like uh, everything is modern and uh, up to date, uh, like a, uh, you know, the, the place in Mumbai. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about places that literally, they barely have mail. They just got our CDs today. It took three months to get there, but they got our CDs today because they want to learn Torah. Nigeria told us that they have Jews over there. We sent them a few thousand CDs. Once we, they got the CDs, they got rid of them on one day. I said, why? It was a few thousand CDs. He says, yeah, we have over 100 Batek Neset. We have over 100 Batek Neset in this town in Nigeria. I said, I didn't even know there's Jews in Nigeria. Akadosh Baruch Hu is giving everyone an opportunity. Every Keilah, 
you're in Nigeria, you're in Afghanistan, you're in Saudi Arabia, you're in India, you're in China, you're in anywhere. You want to do tshuva, HaKadosh Baruch going to get to you. First, you start with learning. Second, you stop sinning the big sins. Third, don't give up. Don't give up on HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Don't give up on yourself. And remember, at some point, everybody's time runs out. HaKadosh Baruch Hu is going to send the Mashiach. Whether it's a personal Mashiach or it's a national Mashiach. Regardless of which one it is, HaKadosh Baruch Hu is going to send them at some point. You can't do tshuva at that point. Barama Masechet Avod Azara at the end of 3a says once Mashiach comes, no more tshuva. No more converts. No more nothing. So now when we went to the Bedin, we knew all this stuff and we wanted to convert as fast as possible. One problem left and then we'll finish and let you guys go home. Problem was I got another infection. I got another infection a few days before it, but I didn't want to call Rabbi Golan and tell him, Rabbi, I have to postpone. Why? Rabbi Golan is a very busy person. Rabbi Eliyahu ben Chaim is a very busy person. I'm not going to call him and say, listen, we've been waiting all this time to become a convert, to become Jews, to become good, and now I have to delay because I happen to have some infection. So I didn't even tell him about it. And I just told my wife, honey, listen, we're going to go, con convert, and then we're going to go to the emergency room. She said, good deal. The problem with these, with, these, with these infections is that they're not like you sit nice and quietly. They double in size every day. Sometimes more. By the time we got to the Bedin, the infection was the size of a melon. I wasn't able to move. I wasn't able to move without pain. The pain was so massive, it's hard for me to explain it to you without giving you another illustration. But I was excited as can be. Why? Because I knew this is the end of the first part of the journey. So, we passed the conversion, went to the mikveh, and when she comes out, she says, okay, so we're going to the hospital? I said, no. We're not. We're going to get married. She says, but you're sick. I said, not anymore. She says, what do you mean you're not sick anymore? I said, the pain stopped. She goes, how did it stop? I said, I don't know, but who cares? It stopped. Let's get married. It's a good deal. Okay, so let's go to the hotel. Let's go to the hotel, get dressed, everything. Back to the original plan A. We go to the hotel. We put some clothes on. Or she put some clothes on. I go to the bathroom and I say, oh, honey, you got to see this. <laughs> she says, what? I open the bathroom and she sees me full of blood. She says, you went to the mikveh, you cleaned your neshama. Apparently, Hashem cleaned mine. He had a different surgery. There was a surgery. There was a surgery. It just wasn't performed in a hospital. Now, some people have a hard time believing this part of the story. I don't really care. I was there. The reality is, Rabotai, is that sometimes, HaKadosh Baruch Hu will make you see certain things based on your emuna in Him based on your desire to do His will. If you put your life on the line for HaKadosh Baruch Hu, and you do the supernatural above and beyond your means, HaKadosh Baruch Hu will do the supernatural for you back. After we saw this live, we saw a real, literally, a surgery happen without a doctor. We saw pain stop immediately. Something that doesn't make any sense, you can't explain it in any other way, I can't even sugarcoat it for you guys. Once you see that, you realize that HaKadosh Baruch Hu not only is alive and well, but He cares about everything, He watches everything, and He's here right now today. He's sitting, He's here, He's enjoying the shiur with you guys. Why? He's, he, he's been making the whole thing the whole, the whole time. He's in your life. He's in everybody's life. All He wants is for us to come back to Him. Be His children like we're supposed to be. Be good kids. This Rabotai Karim is the reason why we do Kiruv. This is why we left Wall Street after losing every single penny to the last dollar. We live on Staka every single month, but we care less. I live, you come to my house, you think I'm a multimillionaire. Why? Because we act like we're millionaires, even though we're not. Because we buy what we need. And what we need, sometimes it's more, sometimes it's less. But Ishtabach Shimon Ad, on Shabbat, the, full, the table is full. The kids need something, they get it. The wife needs something, she gets it. Who pays for it? Akadosh Baruch How? I have no idea. It's not my business. All I know is that I have to do what he wants me to do, and he's going to take care of the rest. 
So when we give lectures, it's free. We give CDs, it's free. Everything we do is free. Why? If I tell you it's going to cost money, guess what? 90% of the invitations stop. Because money is the Yetzara of this generation. Money is like the idol of this generation. You tell people it's going to cost money, already 90% of the lectures get cancelled. So he said, let's not yet, let's not let the Yetzara win before we even start. Let's do everything for free. Invest in the communities for free. Do everything possible for free. So that way we can get, we can meet very nice people and then you realize, you know what? This was priceless. This Rabotai Karim is what I want you to take home. Take home, understand. You have a responsibility not only for yourself, but also for your community. Continue creating more shurim, bring more people, get more people back to HaKadosh Baruch Hu because HaKadosh Baruch Hu has been waiting for us for 3,300 years and time is running out. Bezrat Hashem, this will give each one of us enough chizuk to do retzono kertzono, to do His will like He wants us to do it. And Bezrat Hashem, bring the Mashiach Tzidkenu in a very good way, in a very positive way, where all of Am Yisrael will do tshuva. Questions? Yes. Um, about, about what you mentioned in our family, in the Rashi, Ken. on the Torah and the science. Ken. Uh, about two years ago, I was going through all your Shur Shurim, the CD. And uh, I also went to the computer and listened to Robin Rashi in the Ken. Same kind of person. Sometimes I was lazy and I didn't do it before, but now I do it every time I should listen to Shiur. I went and listened to the Shiur of Rabbi Mitrafi, and I come there from the first from the first hey to the to the car, I mean to the half, forty five letters, not fifty letters. You miscounted. Well how many how many letters did you count? To? It's the fiftieth letter. You're miscounting the first hey. No, no, you're counting the wrong hay. And then between, between, in between, and from the, from the cup to the men, I counted 49 letters. Right. And I counted different ways, different, and all different, all different. Right. So, you know, what, what can you do, what's your advice to me, what can you tell me? You get the right code, that's my advice to you, because you're miscalculating the letters. I mean, I counted it f a thousand times, because... I use it in lectures, first of all. And second of all, this was one of the moving codes to, from, for my wife. So uh, this is one of the things. I counted the letters. My, my question is, do you and your wife went through every single letter? Yes. And you counted every single letter? Yes. Can you show me how to do that? Ken, sure, absolutely. Sure, I'll show it to you. Uh, I'm trying to look for the code. Um, but yeah, I counted it. It's actually the, the 50th letter. It's not the 49th which uh, I made a similar mistake at some point, and I realized that I started from the wrong point. I started frontwards instead of backwards, meaning that I started from the wrong word. But I have it in one of my shiurim, uh, even uh, as a visual of it. But either way, I'll show it to you, Bezod Hashem. Uh, but it's 100% correct. I'll just uh, we go on to the next question, if you have another one, while I look for it. Right. No, that's only a recent creation. That's a recent creation of Christians. It's a recent creation of missionaries. It's not in their New Testament. It's not in their old books. This is a recent creation because in this generation, for the first time in history, the Christians are pretending to be Jews. And what are they doing? They created Jewish names. They created Jewish uh, things that they do. They even opened a yeshiva in Brooklyn. They call it a yeshiva, but it's a, it's a yeshiva of Christians. And they dress in black and white right across the street from a real yeshiva. On top of that, they also started a sect called Messianic Judaism. Even though none of the members are actually Jewish. 
On top of that, they even sent different people. They just caught someone actually in Chicago just a few days ago that was originally caught in New York, ran away from New York, went to Chicago, was caught in Chicago. A couple that both of them look Hasidish. They look more religious than anybody else in this room. He has nice pears and a beard. She has a kisurosh. She looks like she came from Mount Sinai. Guess what? Neither one of them is even Jewish. They go and infiltrate Jewish communities in order for what? So they can start teaching them about their J.C. Penny. They can start teaching them about their Jesus. And they were caught twice already. Now, most recently, after they got caught in Chicago, this was in the papers, you could see it. Uh, they actually also exposed the uh, organization that they're a part of, that their mission, this, this Christian organization's mission, is to go into specifically into religious communities in order to fool people. Now, as far as the Christian church in the past, it was doing us a favor. How? It was just killing bodies. When they, we don't want to be killed, but nonetheless, if we have a choice, we'd rather have our bodies killed than our neshama killed. So in the past, when they wanted us to become Christians and we said no, they'd simply kill the people. Today, they're not even trying to kill the people. They're just trying to kill the neshama. How? They're trying to convince the Jews that they're also Jews. And therefore, we have a common ground. Therefore, we should have same beliefs, same place of worship, same everything else. And then once you're in, they start telling, no, Yeshua, Yeshu is just a creation of the, uh, of the uh, Jews, of the rabbis, the Pharisees. Really, his name is Yeshua, and they just remove them. Just look at Isaiah 53, and look at J Daniel chapter 9, and they mention all types of vague verses that for the common person, or even a person that's learned, but not in this specific subject, will fail miserably to their trap. Reason why? They are expert at it, and the average Jew is not, because an average Jew is not going to learn counter-missionary information. Point being is that the real name of Jesus in the Torah that's mentioned is Yeshu. Imach Shimo Vezichro was added later on. It's not that it was Yeshua and we removed the Ein and therefore we call him Yeshu. No, no. It's Yeshu Imach Shimo Vezichro. His rabbi was a, uh, in a Mishnah, Mishnah Perkei Avot, the sixth Mishnah. Yeshua ben Parachia. Yeshua ben Parachia was his rabbi who gave him an opportunity to do tshuva, and he still rejected it. He's also mentioned the Gemara Masechet Sanhedrin, Masechet Avodah Zarah, Masechet Sota, and even Masechet uh, Shabbat, I believe. He's mentioned in Gitin. Gitin is a wonderful place where they talk about how he's in boiling feces. The point being is that when the church discovered these things, they forced us to change the name. To what? A person. Don't mention the name. Why? They don't like us burning their, uh, their God, their faith God. So... Even in our Gemara, like you go by art school, you're not going to see Yeshu. You're not going to see the name. You're going to see a person or someone. You're not going to see a name at all. Why? Because it, it was censored. But if you look at the original Gemara, you'll see the actual name. So the stuff that they talk about today on YouTube videos, whether it's uh, Michael Brown, this uh, missionary, or it's, a, uh, or it's uh, the other guy, uh, uh, Itzchak, or the other Reshaim that are there, Sid, Sid Roth, all of these missionaries, unfortunately, most of them are Jews. Most of them are Jews. Most of them are smart, and all of them are evil. And they're going to do everything and anything possible, everything and anything possible, to fool you to believing to go to that religion. Why? Going to that religion is the easiest thing in the world you can do. Why? You don't have to do anything. Who wouldn't want to go? Who wants to say, listen, if you believe in some guy that died 2,000 years ago, you can go to heaven. I want to go. If it was real, I'd go myself. But once you start looking in the book itself, you start realizing the book itself is full of errors. Well, let me tell you something. I come from Christianity. Yes. I come from it. And what you're saying is you're lacking knowledge. Yes. They say that when you believe in, in Jesus, then you will go to heaven. That, that's fine. That's one of the ramifications. Other ramifications, no. They say you have to fulfill the commandments of God in order for you to be saved. Yeah, how many Christians keep Shabbat? I'm not talking about the... the oh, which commandments? Are the ones they create? I'm not talking about the Christians that you believe in or you maybe your wife was in. I'm oh, no. Christians. Christianity. And I did my research uh -huh. on all the type of, uh, type of uh, Mashiach, the word 
in the era of the Second Temple, yeah, right. there is a lot of types of Mashiach that were in the era of the Second Temple. And maybe that's one of the ones that are, uh, that are mentioned in the Talmud or in the Gemara, whatever you said, right? So, yeah, that's, that's fine with that. But I'm saying, if you're going to speak about somebody that you don't know, you lack knowledge of, I'd be aware of talking Shohara on that. Because you started by saying, and I would like to speak privately because I don't like to, you know what I'm saying, I don't want to embarrass anybody. Well, here's the thing. You are making a mistake. Number one, you have no idea what you're talking about. Number two, you're talking to somebody that does. Why? Number one. You said, don't speak Lashon against Goin. There's no deen of Lashon against Goin. I can say whatever I want against Christianity because there's no Lashon against Goin. Number two, it's a mitzvah from the Torah to make fun of idolatry. Christianity is 100% idolatry. I can call him Pikachu. I can call him Spider-Man. I can call him Beast-Man. I call him whatever I want because it's a mitzvah. I go to heaven for making fun of Christianity and anything associated with idolatry. Three, you came to a Jewish organization, a Jewish all, Jewish community to talk about Christianity. We're not interested no, no, no. at I'm all. Talking, four, four, I'm to say I don't know what I'm talking about is a very big mistake. And the reason why, I have over a thousand, over a thousand shiurim with several thousand hours that confirm that I do know what I'm talking about. I have a smicha. I have Rabbanim, I have Baruch Hashem, a lot of support, and Ishtabach Shimon I have thousands upon thousands of people that change their life because I do know what I'm talking about. Now, the reality is, the reality is, I fight with Christian missionaries much more than you do. And the reason why is because they're trying to kill my people. You understand? They're trying to kill my people. They're trying to destroy our Ulam So I fight with them every single day. I have a two and a half hour, two hours and 45 minutes video that confirms from beginning to end that Christianity is 100% fake. Not something that's not good, not something that's second best, not something that's misunderstood. No, it's 100% man-made falsehood. Now, anyone that's going to use even an ounce of their time defending any part of it is a fool and is wasting their time. So what I would suggest for you to do is before you start debating for the wrong side, you should know your side better, and you should look. You should look at it. Let me tell you why. You started by saying that you have something against the Jews that were collecting money from you. I do. And then they didn't speak about you, about, you know, about the Mashuva, over the, you know, getting to speak uh, to Hashem. But you, you're talking, you're talking Shofara, because you don't know if they, they, they may be, they may be saying, okay, this guy keeps Shabbat, this guy, you know, why you don't, why don't you judge them in the right way? Okay, because again, like, you're, you're, you're creating you're laws. Saying, you're, saying, you're saying that, yeah, you're, you're allowed to make fun of uh, goyim or anything like that, but... Avu Dazara. I like to make fun of Avu Dazara. Avu Dazara is not just goyim. Okay. Avu Dazara is idol worship. You're allowed to talk Shohara about goyim. Were you talking Shohara about, about Jewish people? No, again, you don't know the, the, the dinim of Lashon Hara. You go look at the Chafetz Chaim, you go to the dinim of Lashon Hara. The Shonara, first and foremost, assumes that you know who I'm talking about. You don't. You don't know who I'm talking about. I didn't mention names. Number two, I'm mentioning something that actually happened in order to do for toilet, in order to help the situation, not in order to insult somebody for the sake of insulting somebody. I didn't have a comedy strip and just to tell you guys jokes about Jews. I'm telling people the truth in order to rebuke the nation, but at the same token, in order to improve the situation. So to assume a better situation would assume you know my situation. My situation was they knew my situation. Why? The, the, the person that wrote the check was my wife. They knew she wasn't Jewish. They spoke to her a million and a half times. They knew I wasn't keeping Shabbat. They came to my office for 15 years. By 15 years, you get to know people really well, especially when they pay your mortgage and your rent and your yeshiva and your everything and anything that you're doing. So to assume that they didn't know would simply be crazy. So they knew, they knew very well, and Baruch Hashem, they still decided to do what they did. For me to say something that that's a wrong thing is a mitzvah for the Torah. Why? When you see something wrong, you're obligated to actually expose it. Especially when that something puts the entire nation in danger. If this type of behavior continues everywhere else, we are all in trouble. Why? If all rabbis start worrying about only money, guess what? You could put the religion in the garbage because we're not going to have any more Jews. That's what the Chida, you ever hear of the Chida? Chida, a few hundred years ago, he says, Judaism declared bankruptcy when rabbis started taking money from rich people. 
Why? As soon as a rich person writes a check, sometimes the rabbi has a yetzerah. What's the yetzerah? Well, he just wrote a check for a million dollars last year, which means that maybe he's going to write a check for a million dollars this year. So let me wait for the check to clear before I tell him the truth about what I think about how his wife doesn't dress properly. Why? You second guess yourself. Why? Because you're thinking, wait, I want to build a big yeshiva. He's the one that has the money. So if I tell him that his wife forgot her dress at home, she forgot her clothes at home, if I tell him that, maybe he's not going to give the money. So he starts doing the accounting and he says, you know what? I'm not going to tell him. Let him first give the tzedakah and then I'll tell him after because it's, everything has already happened. But guess what? After it happened, that passion that you have to rebuke, that passion you have to say the truth is gone. That's why the Yetzirah also has a name called Machal. Machal means tomorrow. Tomorrow. Yetzirah doesn't tell you, don't do the mitzvah. He says, do the mitzvah, just do it tomorrow. Do the mitzvah, just do it tomorrow. Tomorrow, you're not going to have the same passion as you have today. And that's what the Yetzirah wants. So the key is you have to understand, if something came out of my mouth at any one of my lectures, especially the last couple of years, it was verified, it was researched, it's authenticated, it has a source. I don't just speak freely. And the reason why is because I know at this stage that I don't know anything. And that's why every time I mention something, I do my best to quote a source. So you can go look at it, you can go find it, and you can confirm it. Now you did it the wrong way with that specific code. So I have to show it to you. So I'll show it to you, it's not a problem. It's not a problem. It's not a problem to show it to you. It's not a, uh, it's not a, it's not a big secret. Any other questions? Yes. Yes, I mean, it's the same thing. Gambling, uh, the wager is uh, it's, it's gambling. You're not allowed to gamble. The, again, even though in, in every bet, in every bet there's a rule. Every, 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 every form of gamble has some type of rule. And HaKadosh Baruch Hu says that even though even though, thank you for the love. Even though, even though a person agrees to the rules, by the time he lost, something changed. What did change? When he agreed to the rule, the only reason he agreed to the rule is because he assumed he's going to win. So therefore, he's never going to have to give you the money. He never actually took into account that he's going to lose. Because everybody goes into a gamble thinking, what? I'm going to win this time. I'm going to win. This time, I'm going to win, honey. This time, I'm going to bet the house, but I'm going to win this. This, I got today, I have a good luck. Today is this. Today is the day, I'm going to win. And then he loses again. And he says, okay, next time I'm going to win. So the reality is when you agree to those rules, you assume that you're going to win. So after a person loses and he gives the money, he's not giving it willingly. Because he didn't actually think he's ever going to be in this circumstance. He didn't think he's actually going to have to pay up. Now also another thing the Gemara says that when a person gambles, he's no longer considered someone that uh, you could use as a ed, as a witness. Yeah, Kubiot. Somebody that a uh, somebody that's Mesachik Kubiot cannot. Somebody that's a gambler cannot be used as a witness. Huh? Play lottery. Play lotto. Rav Feinstein says you're allowed to play up to the minimum, which is one dollar, meaning a puta. <laughs> Puta, one dollar. And the reason why one dollar is because one dollar, somebody who loses one dollar doesn't change their life. It's considered a puta of the day. It's not recommended, but if you're going to play, then the maximum you're allowed is one dollar. That's not a shame. Somebody uh, wins and uh, doesn't kill themselves within a year. That's what happens to a lot of them. They kill themselves. No, you guys, you guys know it's a curse, right? Win the lotto is a curse. It's not a, it's not a blessing. Win the lotto is a curse. You look at statistics, over 90% of them dec declare bankruptcy within five years. 100% of them declare it as a curse at some point in their life. They commit uh, divorces, uh, all types of murders, all types of... People want to kill themselves after they win the lotto. Initially, it's a blessing, and then it eventually becomes a curse. What does it say? It says in the Torah, Parashat Ve'etchanan, Meshalem el sonav el panav la'avido. He pays his haters cash to their face to destroy them. So that's why the Chachamim say, if you get a lot of money, you don't have to do a big bracha. If you lose money, bracha. Why? Because that bracha, Hashem took your money, it's a blessing because He took the money instead of hitting you, instead of hurting you, the money is damim. But if you got a lot of money, don't do bracha. Why? Maybe it's a curse. Maybe Hashem is punishing you where He's telling you He's going to pay, He's going to give you a lot of money in order to uh, destroy you. So a person needs to know that it's, a, uh, it's, uh, it's not always a blessing like we think.
But as far as uh, as far as the uh, lotto, as far as everything else, it's a uh, okay. I have a book. Don't worry. As far as far as the uh, as far as the um, uh, as far as the uh, gambling, the other reason is that uh, they say that you cannot be a valid witness, and the reason why is because even though technically, technically playing with the dice is not really a su deoraita. It's rabbinical. But why do you still lose the ability to be a ed, to be a uh, valid witness? Is because a witness has to be reliable. Somebody that gambles, even though the rabbi said no, means that he has an obsession with money. And if he has an obsession with money, there's no way we can rely on him to be a valid witness because somebody could bribe him. And since he likes money so much, if he gambles anyway, he'll be bribed anyway, and therefore he cannot be a valid witness. So that's again another reason. I can give you about nine or ten reasons of why the Torah says you're not allowed to gamble in any way, shape, or form. But also Shlomo Amelech says if you want to lose all your money, you should gamble. So a lot of, a lot of interesting things. The Pasuk Shlomo Amelech, I have to think about it for a second. I'll think about it, I'll give it to you. Next. You have a question? Go ahead. Ah, four, four, four. That's what it is. That's why I keep looking at 28, 25. Ah, okay. That's what it is. Ah, here we go. That's what it is. I was keep looking at 29 because it also has it over there. Okay, so chapter four. Chapter uh, Deuteronomy, chapter four. Thank you very much. Chapter four, verse 27. The uh, first word is ve'efits. Ve'efits means that Hashem will scatter. Ve'efits the, uh, the, has the first letter, hey. The first letter is Vav, the second letter is Hey. You count shh, 49 letters, the 50th letter is Chaf. In the word Etchem. Etchem. Which means uh, you're the, the people. Then you count shh, 49 letters, the 50th letter is Mem. Mem in the word Yishmeun. Yishmeun meaning they heard. So what is the spell? Mecca. Same exact Vefits. Vefits, the first letter in that verse, 27, in chapter 4, verse 27, is the letter Yud. You go 50 letters, you go to the word Shama. Shama, the word Shin, the, the letter Shin. That's the uh, second, the first letter in the word Shama, which means heard. And then, sh again, another 49 letters, the, the 50th letter, in the same word Yishmeun, you have the Vav. Yud, Shin, Vav, Imach, Shimo, Vezichro. Shtabach, Shimo, Lahad. Where's the, where's the hey? I mean, where's the ayin? I just told you, the ayin is a recent invention. It's not, it's not a, uh, it's not something that's part of our Torah. It's part of what the Christians added in the last 40, 50 years. If you look at the old books of Christianity, not a single time will you find the word Yeshua. That's a recent invention. But in general, in, in general, you'll also see that in the Torah, when you find uh, codes, when you find secrets, when you find certain things, they always have the code in a place that's talking about the subject. It's not something random. So for example, when it talks, when you want to find out, for example, the details that the Torah knows about AIDS, the name AIDS, the person who discovered AIDS, the, uh, different, the fact that there's never going to be a medicine for AIDS, there's going to be different things that give people more life, but no cure. Or the different doctors that have been uh, pillars within the industry. Or where it comes from. What is it, what's that section talk about? Homosexuality and bestiality. Which are the two things that lead to, that started AIDS and unfortunately till this day spread it. Same thing goes with the Holocaust. Anytime that you want to find out Torah codes about the Holocaust, you want to find out, let's say, Hitler, Imachimo, Eichmann, the uh, gas chambers, the, uh, the trains, the, uh, the, the trials, all the different things that have to do with the Holocaust, even the name HaShoah, which means the Holocaust, you find it in a place in the Torah where it talks about where Hashem is going to hide His face and Hashem is going to punish us by a nation that's going to be a faraway nation represented by an eagle and all types of interesting things that literally, if you understand what it says, describes Germany 100%. So the Torah doesn't just mention codes randomly in different places. It mentions codes exactly where they're supposed to be. I made a mistake as far as quoting it in a uh, different chapter. It's in the same book, just different chapter. But nonetheless, we, Baruch Hashem, thank you to my dear friend, found the correct chapter within the same book. It's chapter 4, not 29, like I mentioned. Next thing.
Yes. Oh, Gemara Maseret Brachot says Yetzara, Malach Hamavet, and Satan all the same thing. What's the difference? Yetzara is the evil inclination within us that convinces you to do something that you're not supposed to do. Look at the girl even though she's not your wife. Eat the food even though it's not kosher. Do the things that Akadosh Baruch Hu said no. After a person fails to this Yetzara, then the Satan, Mastina love, the Satan goes up to Shemaim, same person, same uh, Malach. Goes up to Shemaim and says, Hashem, Hashem, look at what your son is doing. He's eating a cheeseburger. He's eating a cheeseburger. He tells on you. He tells on you. Why? Because he wants to fulfill the role of what? Malach Amavit. He says, Hashem, look what he's doing. He's going against you. So Hashem says, ah, I can't believe my son is going against me. So then he says, oh, Hashem, after all, I am Malach Amavit. Let me kill him. Let me kill him. So he looks like your best friend at first. Says, nah, eat the cheeseburger. Eat the cheeseburger. It's good for you. It has cheese. It's vitamins. Same exact thing. All three are the same thing, but just the Masechet But just thing, but three different things, and also a different part of the Gemara. I believe it's in Avodah Zarah. It mentions that the uh, Malach Hamavit has seven names according to the uh, the uh, David Amelech, Shlomo Amelech, Avraham, Yitzhak, Yaakov. Each call them a different name, but then a different Gemara says that he has other names. Other names, meaning that what are these other names? Why do we care about the names of the Satan, the Malach Hamavit, or this? is that he has a million and a half different ways that he can fool us into doing the wrong thing by making us think it's a mitzvah. So for example, somebody came to the, uh, the Satme Rebbe and uh, told him, Kvod Arav, I have a problem, I have a daughter that needs to get married, but I don't have the money. I need to get $5,000 together to get my daughter married, I don't have any money, what could I do? The Rebbe put the... So don't worry, put his hand in his pocket, took out one dollar, gave it to him, it says, Bacha v'aslacha. He says, thank you, Rebbe, I know this dollar is going to have a blessing, but it's not the Shem, thank you, Rebbe. He leaves. The next day, same guy comes, crying hysterical, Rebbe, I can't believe it, you're never going to, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm back. Rebbe said, what, you didn't get the money? He goes, no, no, after I got the dollar, everybody started donating to me. Mama, your dollar was blessing. I said, you got all the money. He said, got all the money. He says, why are you back? He said, as soon as I got home, I got the money. I said to my daughter, Oh, Hashem, we have the money. We get married now. You get married. She says, Abba, I'm not getting married. Said, Why are you not getting married? She says, because this dress that they want me to wear, $5 dress. I'm not wearing this $5 dress. I'm only going to get married once in my life. I want a $5,000 dress. I want a $5,000 dress. That's what I want. Oh, I'm not getting married. So, Rebbe, what am I going to do? My daughter went crazy. She wants a $5,000 dress. I barely had $5,000 to get her married, but she wants a $5,000 dress, or she's not going to get married. What should I do? The Rebbe says, one second. He turns around, opens the bookshelf, opens the safe, shh, that, takes out $5,000, gives him the whole thing. He gives him hugs, kisses, thank you very much, Rebbe, I love you, I love you, I love you. Mazal tov. Now, all of, uh, all of the people here have the same look as the guy that was sitting next to him, one of his Talmudim. He says, what, what just happened here? The wedding, he gave him $1. This chutzpan and his daughter come back, they want $5,000, he gave him the whole thing. She says, Rebbe, lamdeni, teach me. What happened here? You know how you could have done with this $5,000? You could have gave it to the Avrechim. The, the guys are making $500 a month. You could have given them some extra, maybe $600 to $20, $30, $40, $50, 50 Avrechim. You could have given it to the Yeshiva, maybe get another extension. You could have put it in a kolel. You could have given it to the Anim, all the, all the poor people. You could have given it to the, to the converts. They don't have anything miskinim, poor people. You could have done so much with this Kvod Why did you give it to this guy? This chutzpah, this rude person asking $5,000 for a dress. So the Rebbe says to him, the Rebbe says to him, he says, you know, you're right. <coughs> you're right. The kolel, the avachim, the yeshiva, the homeless, the poor, the convert, all of those 100% right. And I thought everything you said, I thought the same thing. I said, you're 100% right. When he was asking me for the money, I said, I can, I can use this money for this and for this and for this and for this and for this. I can use it in so many other ways. But you know why I gave it to him? Because I said to myself, if I really wanted to give it to the converts and the homeless and the poor and the kolel and the yeshiva and this, how come I didn't think about this mitzvah before this poor guy came to me? How come I didn't think about this mitzvah before HaKadosh Baruch Hu presented me with a mitzvah that I'm supposed to do now? So what did that teach me? That taught me that the real mitzvah to do is the one that HaKadosh Baruch Hu sent me, which is to make a, a bride happy. The other mitzvot, as of now, Yetzara. 
sent him. The Satan sent those mitzvot. Why? Because he doesn't want to make me, he doesn't want to allow me to get this woman to be happy and get married and Baruch Hashem bring more Jews to the world. All of a sudden, I'm remembering things that are not relevant. If I really want to help all those people with this money, I would have already done it. And therefore, sometimes the Satan even brings you a mitzvah. Even brings you a mitzvah. Why? He wants to get your attention away from the mitzvah you're supposed to do. In general, this is usually a test for bigger people. For people that Baruch Hashem are big Talmidei Chachamim and know how to decipher so on and so forth. But the point is, is that the Gemara teaches us that the Satan has no limitations of which role he's going to play in order to fool you. In order to create some type of distance between you and HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Because that's his job after all. That's his job in the world. But at the same token, the Gemara also says that he was very good friends with Tzadikim. He was very good friends with certain tzaddikim. Why? He loves them. He says, you're a tzaddik. Good for you. You're also a servant of Hashem. You're also a servant of Hashem. I'm a servant of Hashem. You're a servant of Hashem to publicize Torah. I'm a servant of Hashem to be the pressure to stop it. So if you overcome it, good. I'm happy because that means we're both servants of Hashem. But if you fail, then I'm the only one that's a servant of Hashem. And I have to do my job. Can he, uh, he cursed him and then he came to him. Suck. Anything else? Beseda Rabotai, anyone that wants a private meeting, anything specific, Bezad Hashem? Huh? Yesterday I wanted to kill him. They gave him 40 days or 30 days, and he said, Hashem Shibaro. Hashem Adam, when we give Betamudo Beyado. And the Chachamim say that that means that the person needs to come up to Shemaim with a book that he wrote. Some Hidushim that he wrote in this world, Bezad Hashem. Beseda, thank you very much for learning with me, Rabotai. This school of mitzvot. Baruch Adonai Leolam. Amen. Amen. Also, anyone that wants to take on the mitzvah of tzitzit, anyone that wants to take on the mitzvit, anyone that wants to take on the mitzvah of kisu rosh, real kisu rosh, not the wig, but actually a mitvachat, like a real Jewish woman, I have them for free here. I have them for free just to be a partner in the mitzvah. So please come and I'll give it to you. There's some mitvachot we got from Yerushalayim and tzitzit we got from Yerushalayim. Kadosh Baruch Hu, Baruch Hu, Rafua Shlema, Rafua Tanef, Rafua Tanef, Chaim Aokim, Shlemi, Melim Torah, Mitzvot, Milu Chasadim. ובעזרת השם תהיה תמיד חכם בעזרת השם ותעלה מעלה מעלה בעזרת השם לקיים תשובה שלמה בעזרת השם Oh, I was looking at it the whole time. It's on it's under the it's under the, under the book. שלא בריא להיות עצבני? כן, גמרא מסך את הבודה שלך. לא, 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 הוא אמר, בחלום לדודה שלי, שאני בריא לא להיות עצבני. אני עצבני מאוד, מאוד מאוד. כן, אה, אתה עצבני מאוד מאוד, אז... אתה בחלום, הוא אמר, שאז הוא יודע ברוח הקודש, כמו לבביץ', אבל הוא... הוא יענה לטוב שהוא מתפלל בשביל. ברוך השם. ובאבי שאמר לי להיות בשקט, לא לדבר. בחלום, הוא אמר, שרואים בחלום, יוסף הצדיק, יוסף הצדיק, בעל החלומות, בן זיכונים, לא כותב נתפסים, אל תגזו בדרך, שלא יהיה לי יצרה. בעזרת השם, בעזרת השם. זה אולי רפואה שלמה לשלמה יוסף בן חוסני, אני מבין, אני ראיתי את הלסט לפני, אני פשוט לא אמרתי את זה בלעוד. שלמה יוסף בן חוסני, רפואה שלמה תורחל בת מרים, רפואה שלמה תמרה יעל בת רחל, תמרה יעל טוב בת רחל, לילוי נשמת מלכיאל הכהן בן יפה, לילוי נשמת רחמין הכהן בן מלכה, זה הקיימת שרה בת אילנורה, רבקה, ויוסף בן נינה, ואולסו רפואה שלמה דוד בן נסריה, דוריס בת ג'ורה, לבנה בת שרה, שרה בת לבנה יעקב בן שלום, רפואה שלמה? רפואה שלמה? רחמים בן תמר, רפואה שלמה? אין אור דבר מישראל בעזרת השם, רפואה שלמה, רפואת הנפש, רפואת הגוף, זו תשובה שלמה לכל עם ישראל בעזרת השם. It's recording? Okay. Okay, who's taking on me? Tzit, tzit, tzit. I'm just going to have both. Yeah? You're going to pull on tzit, tzit. You have kippah, kippah. You have kippah, kippah. No, I have kippah. You have kippah. You have kippah. You have kippah. You have kippah. We're going to stop it. Who is going to take on me? Tzit, tzit. Who doesn't have a tzit, tzit? They're going to take on me. Tzit, tzit. Who was the one? There was one over here. It was a good customer over here.
Anybody else need Kisur Rosh from the back? Kisur Rosh, Kisur Rosh, Kisur Rosh, anyone that's married? Not if you're not married. If you're not married, there's no need for Kisur Rosh unless you want to be based on the Ramba. You guys are letting me down. Nobody's taking on Titi because all of you are Tadikim already. Why did I come here? I was going to the people. This is the first Question. Okay. Uh, we, we know that wasting seed.